You're listening to the Hour of the Time, and I'm your host, William Cooper. Two men in the year 1092 stood on the ramparts of a medieval castle, the Eagle's Nest, perched high upon the crags of the Persian mountains. The personal representative of the emperor and the veiled figure who claimed to be the incarnation of God on earth, Hassan, son of Sabah, sheikh of the mountains and leader of the assassins, spoke, quote, You see that devotee standing guard on younger turret top? Watch, unquote. He made a signal. Instantly, the white-robed figure threw up his hands in salutation and cast himself 2,000 feet into the foaming torrent which surrounded the fortress. I have 70,000 men and women throughout Asia, and each of them ready to do my bidding. Can your master, Malik Shah, say the same? That he asked me to surrender to his sovereignty? This is your answer. Go. Now, such a scene may be worthy of the most exaggerated of horror films, and yet it took place in historical fact. The only quibble made by the chronicler of the time was that Hassan's devotees numbered only about 40,000. How this man Sabah came by his uncanny power and how his devotees struck terror into the hearts of men from the Caspian to Egypt is one of the most extraordinary of all tales of the secret societies, the mysteries. Today, the sect of the Hashishin, our druggers, still exists in the form of the Ismailis, our Ishmaelites, whose undisputed chief, endowed by them with divine attributes, is the Aga Khan. Like many another secret cult, the assassin organization was based upon an earlier association. And in order to understand how they worked and what their objectives were, we must begin with these roots. It must be remembered, dear listeners, that the followers of Islam in the 7th century A.D. split into two divisions, the Orthodox, who regard Muhammad as the bringer of divine inspiration, and the Shias, who consider that Ali, his successor, the fourth imam or leader, was more important. It is with the Shias that we are concerned here. From the beginning of the split in the early days of Islam, the Shias relied for survival upon secrecy, organization, and initiation. Although the minority party in Islam, they believed that they could overcome the majority and eventually the whole world by superior organization and power. To this end, they started a number of societies which practiced secret rites in which the personality of Ali was worshipped, and whose rank and file were trained to struggle above all for the accomplishment of world dominion. One of the most successful secret societies which the Shias founded was centered around the abode of learning in Cairo, which was the training ground for fanatics who were conditioned by the most cunning methods to believe in a special divine mission. In order to do this, the original democratic Islamic ideas had to be overcome by skilled teachers acting under the orders of the Caliph of the Fatimites who ruled Egypt at that time. Members were enrolled on the understanding that they were to receive hidden power and timeless wisdom which would enable them to become as important in life as some of the teachers. And you find these same precepts in every branch in every nationality, on every continent where the mysteries prevail. The caliphs saw to it that the instructors were no ordinary men. The supreme judge was one of them. Another was the commander-in-chief of the army. A third, the minister of the court. There was no lack of applicants. In any country where the highest officials of the realm formed a body of teachers, one would find the same thing. Classes were divided into study groups, some composed of men, others of women, collectively termed assemblies of wisdom. All lessons were carefully prepared, written down, and submitted to the caliph for his seal. At the end of the lecture, all present kissed the seal. For did the caliph not claim direct descent from Muhammad through his son-in-law Ali, and thence from Ishmael, the seventh imam? He was the embodiment of divinity, far more than any Tibetan lama ever was. 
The university, lavishly endowed and possessing the best manuscripts and scientific instruments available, received a grant of a quarter of a million gold pieces annually from the caliph. Its external form was similar to the pattern of the ancient Arab universities, not much different from Oxford, but its real purpose was the complete transformation of the mind of the student. Students had to pass through nine degrees of initiation, the same number that are claimed in the York Rite of Freemasonry. In the first, the teachers threw their pupils into a state of doubt about all conventional ideas, religious and political. They used false analogy and every other device of argument to make the aspirant believe that what he had been taught by his previous mentors was prejudiced and capable of being challenged. The effect of this, according to the Arab historian Makrizi, was to cause him to lean upon the personality of the teachers as the only possible source of the proper interpretation of facts. At the same time, the teachers hinted continually that formal knowledge was merely the cloak for hidden, inner, and powerful truth, whose secret would be imparted when the youth was ready to receive it. None ever questioned why no secret was ever put forth. This confusion technique was carried out until the student reached the stage where he was prepared to swear a vow of blind allegiance to one or other of his teachers. The oath, together with certain secret signs, was administered in due course, and the candidate awarded the first degree of initiation. The second degree took the form of initiation into the fact that the imams, the successors of Muhammad, were the true and only sources of secret knowledge and power. Imams inspired the teachers, therefore the student was to acknowledge every saying and act of his appointed guide as blessed and divinely inspired. In the third degree, the esoteric names of the seven imams were revealed, and the secret words by which they could be conjured, and by which the powers inherent in the very repetition of their names, could be liberated and used for the individual, especially in the service of the sect. In the fourth degree, the succession of the seven mystical lawgivers and magical personalities was given to the learner. These were characterized as Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and Ishmael. There were seven mystical helpers, Seth, Shem, Ishmael, Aaron, Simon, Ali, and Muhammad, the sons of Ishmael. This last was dead, but he had a mysterious deputy who was the Lord of the time, authorized to give his instructions to the people of truth, as the Ismailis called themselves. This hidden figure gave the caliph the power to pretend that he was acting under even higher instructions. The fifth degree names twelve apostles under the seven prophets, whose names and functions and magical powers were described. In this degree, the power to influence others by means of personal concentration was supposed to be taught. One writer claims that this was done merely by the repetition for a period of three years to train the mind of the magical word ak zapt -e. To obtain the sixth degree involved instructions in the methods of analytical and destructive argument in which the postulate had to pass a very stiff examination. The seventh degree brought revelations of the great secret that all humanity and all creation were one and every single thing was a part of the whole, which included the creative and destructive power, the androgynous God. But as an Ishmaeli, the individual could make use of the power which was ready to be awakened within him and overcome those who knew nothing of the immense potential of the rest of humanity. This power came through the aid of the mysterious power called the Lord of the Time. To qualify for the eighth degree, the aspirant had to believe that all religion, philosophy, and the like were fraudulent. All that mattered was the individual, who could attain fulfillment only through servitude to the greatest developed power, the imam. The ninth and last degree brought the revelation of the secret that there was no such thing as belief, all that mattered was action, and the only possessor of the reasons for carrying out any action was the chief of the sect. 
As a secret society, the organization of the Ismailis, as outlined above, was undoubtedly powerful and seems likely to produce a large number of devotees who would blindly obey the orders of whomever was in control of the edifice. But, as with many other bodies of this kind, there were severe limitations from the point of view of effectiveness. Perhaps the phase of revolt or subversion planned by the society did not in the end get underway. Perhaps it was not intended to work by any other means than training the individual. Be that as it may, its real success extended abroad only to Baghdad in 1058, where a member gained temporary control of Baghdad and coined money in the Egyptian Caliph's name. Now this sultan was slain by the Turks, who now entered the picture, and the Cairo headquarters was also threatened. By 1123, the society was closed down by the vizier Afdal. The rise of Turkish power seemed to have discouraged the expansionist Cairo sect so strongly that they almost faded out, and very little is heard of them after that day. It was left to Hassan, son of Sabah, the old man of the mountains, to perfect the system of the alien secret society, and found an organization which has endured for another thousand years. Who was Hassan? Well, he was the son of a Shia, Ali worshipper, and Khorasan, a most bigoted man who claimed that his ancestors were Arabs from Kufa. Now, this assumption was probably due to the fact that such a lineage bolstered up claims to religious importance then as now among Muslims. You see, the people of the neighborhood, many of them also Shias, stated very decisively that this Ali was a Persian, and so were his forebears. So it is generally thought that this is the truer version. As the governor of the province was an Orthodox Muslim, Ali spared no efforts to assume the same guise. Now this is considered to be completely permissible, the doctrine of intelligent dissimulation. As there was some doubt as to his reliability in the religious sense, he retired into a monastic retreat and sent his son Hassan to an Orthodox school. This school was no ordinary one. It was a circle of disciples presided over by the redoubtable Imam Muafiq, about whom it was said that every individual who enrolled under him eventually rose to great power. It was here that Hassan met Omar Khayyam, the tentmaker poet and astronomer, later to be the poet laureate of Persia. Another of his schoolmates, was Nizam al-Mulk, who rose from peasanthood to become prime minister. These three made a pact, according to Nizam's autobiography, whereby whichever one rose to high office first would help the others. And that tenet has survived to this day. It is how their own infiltrate all levels of society, military, and government and then pull their brothers up into positions below them. It is the method for infiltrating and controlling large masses, populations, governments, military organizations, and society as a whole. Nizam, the courtier, became vizier to Alp Arslan, the Turkish sultan of Persia, in a very relatively short time. He helped Omar in accordance with his vow and secured him a pension which gave him a life of ease and indulgence in his beloved Nishapur where many of his Rubiat poems were written. Meanwhile, Hassan remained in obscurity, wandering through the Middle East waiting for his chance to attain the power of which he had dreamed. Arslan the lion died and was succeeded by Malik Shah. Suddenly, Hassan presented himself to Nizam, demanding to be given a place at court. Delighted to fulfill his childhood vow, the vizier obtained for him a favored place and relates what transpired thus in his autobiography. Quote, 
I had him made a minister by my strong and extravagant recommendations. Like his father, however, he proved to be a fraud, hypocrite, and a self-seeking villain. He was so clever at dissimulation that he appeared to be pious when he was not, and before long he had somehow completely captured the mind of the Shah." Unquote. Now, Malik Shah was young, and Hassan was trained in the Shia art of winning people over by apparent honesty, which means it has the appearance or the look of honesty, but truly is not. Just as the notice of apparent violations sent by the FCC. <laughs> but Nizam was still the most important man of the realm, with an impressive record of honest dealing and achievements. Hassan decided to eliminate him. The king had asked in that year, 1078, for a complete accounting of the revenue and expenditure of the empire, and Nizam told him that this would take over a year. Hassan, on the other hand, claimed that the whole work could be done in 40 days and offered to prove it. There's that 40 days again. The task was assigned to him, and the accounts were prepared in the specified time. Something went wrong at this point. The balance of historical opinion holds that Nizam struck back at the last moment, saying, quote, By Allah, this man will destroy us all unless he is rendered harmless, though I cannot kill my playmate, unquote. And whatever the truth may be, it seems that Nizam managed to have such disparities introduced into the final calligraphic version of the accounts that when Hassan started to read them, they appeared so absurd that the Shah, in fury, ordered him to be exiled. As he had claimed to have written the accounts in his own hand, Hassan could not justify their incredible deficiency and could not slough the blame off upon his friend. Hassan had friends in Isfahan, where he immediately fled. There survives a record of what he said there, which sheds interesting light upon what was in his mind. One of these friends, Abu al-Fazal, notes that Hassan, after reciting the bitter tale of his downfall, shouted these words in a state of uncontrollable rage. Quote, if I had two, just two devotees who would stand by me, then I would cause the downfall of that Turk and that peasant, unquote. Fazal concluded that Hassan had taken leave of his senses and tried to get him out of this ugly mood. Hassan took umbrage and insisted that he was working on a plan and that he would have his revenge. He set off for Egypt there to mature his plans. Fazal was himself later to become a devotee of the assassin chief, and Hassan, two decades later, reminded him of that day in Isfahan. Here I am at Alamut, master of all I survey, and more. The sultan and the peasant vizier are dead. Have I not kept my vow? Was I the madman you thought me to be? I found my two devotees who were necessary to my plans, unquote. Hassan himself takes up the story of how his fortunes fared after the flight from Persia. He had been brought up in the secret doctrines of Ishmaelism, the Arab branch of the mysteries, and recognized the possibilities of power inherent in such a system. He knew that in Cairo there was a powerful nucleus of the society, and if we are to believe the words of Fazal, he already had a plan whereby he could turn their followers into disciplined, devoted fanatics willing to die for a leader. What was this plan? Well, he had decided that it was not enough to promise paradise, fulfillment, eternal joy to people. He would actually show it to them. Show it in the form of an artificial paradise where howries played and fountains gushed, sweet-scented waters where every sensual wish was granted, amid beautiful flowers and gilded pavilions. And this, dear listeners, is what he eventually did. Hassan chose a hidden valley for the site of his paradise, described by Marco Polo, who passed this way in 1271. Quote, 
In a beautiful valley enclosed between two lofty mountains, he had formed a luxurious garden stored with every delicious fruit and every fragrant shrub that could be procured. Palaces of various sizes and forms were erected in different parts of the grounds, ornamented with works of gold, with paintings, and with furniture of rich silks. By means of small conduits contained in these buildings, streams of wine, milk, honey, and some of pure water were seen to flow in every direction. The inhabitants of these places were elegant and beautiful damsels accomplished in the arts of singing, playing upon all sorts of musical instruments, dancing, and especially those of dalliance and amorous allurement. Clothed in rich dresses, they were seen continually sporting and amusing themselves in the garden and pavilions, their female guardians being confined within doors and never allowed to appear. The object which the chief had in view in forming a garden of this fascinating kind was simply this, that Mohammed, having promised to those who should obey his will the enjoyments of paradise, where every species of sensual gratification should be found, in the society of beautiful nymphs, he was desirous of it being understood by his followers that he also was a prophet and a compeer of Muhammad, and had the power of admitting to paradise such as he and he alone should choose to favor. In that order, and in order that none without his license should find their way into this delicious valley, he caused a strong and inexpungible castle to be erected at the opening to it, through which the entry was by a secret passage, and thus the legend of Shambhala, or the paradise in the mountains, a valley of lush greenery, unending fruits, fair, beautiful maidens, Thus the legend began. Hassan began to attract young men from the surrounding countryside between the ages of twelve and twenty, particularly those whom he marked out as possible material for the production of killers. And every day he held court, a reception at which he spoke of the delights of paradise, and at certain times, he caused drops of a soporific nature to be administered to ten or sometimes a dozen youths. And when half dead with sleep, drugged out of their minds, he had them conveyed to the several places and apartments of the garden. Upon awakening from this state of lethargy, their senses were struck by all the delightful objects, and each perceiving himself surrounded by lovely damsels, singing, playing, and attracting his regards by the most fascinating caresses, serving him also with delicious viands and exquisite wines, until, intoxicated with excess and enjoyment, amidst actual, actual, real rivers of milk and wine, he believed himself assuredly in paradise and felt an unwillingness to relinquish its delights. When four or five days had thus been passed, they were thrown once more into a state of somnolency, drugged and carried out of the garden. Then, upon being carried to his presence and questioned by him as to where they had been, their answer was, In paradise, through the favor of your highness. And then, before the whole court who listened to them with eager astonishment and curiosity, they gave a circumstantial account of the scenes to which they had been witnesses. The chief, thereupon addressing them, said, quote, We have the assurance of our prophet that he who defends his Lord shall inherit paradise. And if you show yourselves, if you show yourselves to be devoted to the obedience of my orders, that happy lot awaits you, unquote. Now, suicide was at first attempted by some to be able to return to the paradise that they had just left, not knowing that it was an illusion. But the survivors were early told that only death in the obedience of Hassan's orders could give the key to paradise. And in the 11th century, it was not only credulous Persian peasants who would have believed such things were true, 
Even among the more sophisticated people, the reality of the gardens and auries of paradise were completely accepted. True, a good many Sufis preached that the garden was allegorical, but that still left more than a few people who believed that they could trust the evidence of their senses. The Ancient Art of Imposture by Abdul Rahman of Damascus gives away another trick of Hassan's. You see, he had a deep, narrow pit sunk into the floor of his audience chamber. One of his disciples stood in this in such a way that his head and neck alone were visible above the floor, and around the neck was placed a circular dish in two pieces which fitted together with a hole in the middle, and this gave the impression that there was a severed head on a metal plate standing on the floor. Now, in order to make the scene more plausible, if that is the word, Hassan had some fresh blood poured around the head on the plate. Then the recruits were brought in, the initiates. Tell them, commanded the chief, what thou hast seen. Then the disciple, appearing as a head on the plate, described the delights of paradise. Quote, you have seen the head of a man who died, whom you all knew. I have reanimated him to speak with his own tongue, unquote. And then he would really sever treacherously the man's head in real earnest and stuck for some time somewhere that the faithful would see it. And the effect of this conjuring trick, plus murder, increased the enthusiasm for martyrdom to the required degree and gave him unbelievable control over his flock. There are many documented instances of the recklessness of the Fidein devotees of the Ismailis, one witness being a Westerner who was treated a century later to a similar spectacle to that which had appalled the envoy of Malik Shah. But we've got to take a break first, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. Henry, Count of Champagne, reports that he was traveling in 1194 through Ismaili territory. Quote, the chief sent some persons to salute him and beg that on his return he would stop at and partake of the hospitality of the castle. The count accepted the invitation. As he returned, the Dai el Kibir, our great missionary, advanced to meet him, showed him every mark of honor, and let him view his castle and fortresses. Having passed through several, they came at length to one of the towers which rose to an exceeding height. On each tower stood two sentinels clad in white. These, said the chief, pointing to them, obey me far better than the subjects of your Christians obey their lords. And at a given signal, two of them flung themselves down and were dashed to pieces. If you wish, said he to the astonished count, all my white ones shall do the same. The benevolent count shrank from the proposal and candidly avowed that no Christian prince could presume to look for such obedience from his subjects. When he was departing with many valuable presents, the chief said to him meaningly, By means of these trusty servants, I get rid of the enemies of our society. Unquote. Now, further details of the mentality of Hassan are given in what is supposed to be an autobiographical account of his early days. And it probably is, in fact, such because the method of his conversion does seem to follow the pattern which has been observed in fanatics of whatever religious or political persuasion. He was, he says, reared in the belief of the divine right of the imams by his father. He early met an Ismaili missionary, Emir Dareb, with whom he argued strenuously against the emir's particular form of the creed. Then, some time later, he went through a bout of severe illness in which he feared to die and began to think that the Ismaili doctrine might really be the road to redemption and paradise. If he died unconverted, he might be damned. Thus it was that as soon as he recovered, he sought out another Ismaili propagandist, 
Abu Najam, and then others. Eventually, he went to Egypt to study the creed at its headquarters. He was received with honor by the caliph due to his former position at the court of Malik Shah. In order to increase their own importance, the high officials of the court made a good deal of public play of the significance of the new convert. But this fact seemed in the end to help Hassan more than it did them. He entered into political intrigue and was arrested, then confined in a fortress. No sooner had he entered the prison than a minaret collapsed, and in some unexplained way this was interpreted as an omen that Hassan was in reality a divinely protected person. The caliph, hurriedly making Hassan a number of valuable gifts, had him put aboard a ship sailing for northwest Africa. This gave him the funds which he was to use for setting up his paradise. And also, through some quirk of faith, the disciples whom he sought. A tremendous storm blew up, terrifying the captain, crew, and passengers alike. Prayers were held, and Hassan was asked to join. He refused. Quote, the storm is my doing. How can I pray that it abate? Unquote, he asked. And then says this, quote, I have indicated the displeasure of the Almighty. If we sink, I shall not die, for I am immortal. If you want to be saved, believe in me, and I shall subdue the winds, unquote. Well, at first, the offer was not accepted. Presently, however, when the ship seemed on the point of capsizing, the desperate passengers came to him and swore eternal allegiance. The sun was still very calm, and continued so until the storm abated. The ship was then driven on to the seacoast of Syria, where Hassan disembarked together with two of the merchant passengers who became his first real disciples. Hassan was not yet ready for the fulfillment of his destiny as he saw it for the time being. He was traveling under the guise of a missionary of the Caliph in Cairo. From Aleppo he went to Baghdad, seeking a headquarters where he should be safe from interference and where he yet could become powerful enough to expand. Into Persia the road led him, traveling through the country, making converts to his ideas which were still apparently strongly based upon the secret doctrines of the Egyptian Ismailis. Everywhere he created a really devoted disciple, Arfidei, he bade him stay and try to enlarge the circle of his followers. These circles became hatching grounds for the production of self-sacrificers, the initiates who were drawn from the ranks of the most promising ordinary converts. Thus it was that miniature training centers modeled upon the abode of learning were in being within a very few months of his return to his homeland. During his travels, a trusted lieutenant, one Hussein Kahini, reported that the Iraqi district where the fortress of Alumat was situated seemed to be an ideal place for proselytism. Most of the ordinary people of that place, in fact, had been persuaded into the Ismaili way of thinking. The only obstacle was the government. Ali Mahdi who looked upon the caliph of Baghdad as his spiritual and temporal lord. The first converts were expelled from the country, but before many months, however, there were so many Ismailis among the populace that the governor was compelled to allow them to return. Hassan, though he would not brook, would not allow him. The prospective owner of Alamut decided to try a trick. He offered the governor 3,000 pieces of gold for the amount of land which could be encompassed by the hide of an ox. When Mahdi agreed to such a sale, Hassan produced a skin, cut it into the thinnest possible thongs, and joined them together to form a string which encompassed the castle of Alamut. Although the governor refused to honor any such bargain, Hassan produced an order from a very highly placed official of the Seljuk rulers, ordering that the fortress be handed over to Hassan for 3,000 gold pieces. Well, it turned out that this official was himself a secret follower of the Sheik of the Mountain. 
The year was A.D. 1090. Hassan was now ready for the next part of his plan. He attacked and routed the troops of the emir who had been placed in the governorship of the province and wielded the people of the surrounding districts into a firm band of diligent and trustworthy workers and soldiers answerable to him and him alone. Within two years, the vizier Nazim al-Mulk had been stabbed to the heart by an assassin sent by Hassan, and the emperor Malik Shah, who dared to send troops against him, died in grave suspicion of poison. Hassan's revenge upon his class fellow was to make him the very first target of his reign of terror. You see, with the king's death, the whole realm was split up into warring factions. For long, the assassins alone retained their cohesion. In under a decade, they had made themselves masters of all Persian Iraq and of many forts throughout the empire. This they did by forays, direct attack, the poisoned dagger, and in any other manner which seemed expedient indeed, the ends always justified the means. The Orthodox religious leaders pronounced one interdict after another against their doctrines, all, to no effect. By now, the entire loyalty of the Ismailis under him had been transferred from the Caliph to the personality of the Sheik of the Mountain, who became the terror of every prince in that part of Asia. The crusader chiefs included. Despite and despising fatigues, dangers, and tortures, the assassins joyfully gave their lives whenever it pleased the great master who required them either to protect himself or to carry out his mandates of death. The victim, having been pointed out, the faithful, clothed in a white tunic with a red sash, the colors of innocence and blood, went on their mission without being deterred by distance or danger. Having found the person they sought, they awaited the favorable moment for slaying him, and their daggers very seldom ever missed their aim. Richard the Lionheart was at one time accused of having asked the Lord of the Mountain to have Conrad of Montferrat killed, a plot which was carried out thus, quote, Two assassins allowed themselves to be baptized, and placing themselves beside him, seemed intent only on praying. But the favorable opportunity presented itself. They stabbed him, and one took refuge in the church. But hearing that the prince had been carried off still alive, he again forced himself into Montferrat's presence, and stabbed him a second time, and then expired without a complaint amidst refined tortures." Unquote. You see the method of controlling men's minds that Hassan had perfected was extremely effective and powerful. And not one, not even one incident of one of his followers failing to carry out his orders exactly can be found. The order of the assassins had perfected their method of securing the loyalty of human beings to an extent and on a scale which has seldom been paralleled. The assassins carried on the battle on two fronts. You see, they fought whichever side in the crusade served their purposes. They fought with the Knights Templar and they fought against the Knights Templars. At the same time, they continued the struggle against the Persians. The son and successor of Nizam al-Mulk, was laid low by an assassin dagger. The sultan who had succeeded his father, Malik Shah, and gained power over most of his territories, was marching against them. One morning, however, he walked with an assassin weapon stuck neatly into the ground near his head. Within it was a note warning him to call off the proposed siege of Alamut. Well, he came to terms with the assassins after that. Powerful ruler, though, he undoubtedly was. You see, the assassins eventually had what amounted to a free hand in exchange for a pact by which they promised to reduce their military power. It was during their pacts, their treaties, their battles with the Knights Templars, that many, some say most, 
some few even say all of the Knights Templars were initiated into the mysteries. Hassan lived for 34 years after his acquisition of Alamut. On only two occasions since then had he even left his room. Yet he ruled an invisible empire as great and as fearsome as any man before or since, they say. But his empire may still exist today, changed and melded with other sects of the mysteries. Hassan seemed to realize that death was almost upon him and calmly began to make plans for the perpetual continuance, folks of the Order of the Assassins. And we now begin the latter days of the Assassins, which we will not finish in this hour, but will finish in the next. The ruler of one of the most terrifying organizations the world has ever known was without a lineal successor. In fact, he had had both of his sons killed, one for carrying out an unauthorized murder and the other for drinking wine. Certainly a case of do as I say, not as I do. He called his two most trusted lieutenants from the strongholds which they maintained on his behalf, Kia Buzurg Umid, Kia of Great Promise, and Abu Ali of Quazwin. Kia was to inherit the spiritual and mystical aspect, while Abu Ali attended to the military and administrative affairs of the order. It is said that Hassan bin Sabah died almost immediately afterwards, in 1124, at 90 years of age, having given the world a new word, assassin. Assassin in Arabic signifies guardians, and some commentators have considered this to be the true origin of the word guardians of the secrets, which the Knights Templar took to Europe. The organization of the order under Hassan called for missionaries, friends who were disciples and Fedavis devotees. The last group had been added by Hassan to the Ismaili original, and these were the trained killers. Fedavis wore white with a girdle cap or boots of red. In addition to careful coaching in where and when to place the dagger in the victim's bosom, they were trained in such things as languages, the dress and manners of monks, merchants, and soldiers, any of whom they were ready to impersonate in carrying out their mission. The chief was known as Sayedna, which means our prince or leader, and popularly because of the mountain stronghold of Alamut as the Sheik of the Mountain. Now, Alamut, or the stronghold on the mountain, was also known as the Eagle's Nest. And this is what Hitler named his mountain retreat. And there's also an Eagle's Nest near Santa Barbara, California, which very few people know anything about yet. Now, the Sheik of the Mountain is the figure referred to in Crusaders' writings as Sidney, or Sinex de Monte, the first word being a literal translation of the word peer, Persian for ancient or sage. There were three great missionaries who ruled three territories. After the friends and feet of ease came to the Lazics, aspirants who were being trained for membership of the society but were as yet uninitiated. The Hassan reduced the original number of degrees of initiation from nine to the mystical number of seven. A similar number of regulations formed the rules of the order. This, in fact, comprised the working plan of the spreading of the faith. The first rule was that the missionary must know human psychology in such a way as to be able to select suitable people for admission to the cult, and was summed up in the mnemonic, quote, cast no seed upon rocks, unquote. The second rule of procedure was the application of flattery and gaining the confidence of the prospective member. Third came the casting of doubt into the mind by superior knowledge. Fourthly, the teacher must apply an oath to the student never to betray any of the truths which were to be revealed to him. 
Now he was told as the fifth stage that Ishmaelism was a powerful secret organization supported by some of the most important figures of the time. After this, the aspirant was questioned and studied to discover whether he had absorbed the opinions of the teacher and attached himself sufficiently into a position of dependence upon his ideas. And at this stage, he was asked to meditate upon the meaning of the reported saying of the prophet that, quote, paradise lies in the shadow of swords, unquote. In the final degree, many difficult passages of the Quran were explained in terms of allegory. How is it that the rules of this extraordinarily successful order are known in such detail? Well, it so happened that when the Mongols eventually overthrew Alamut by force of arms, their chief, Halaku, meaning destruction, Khan, asked his chief minister to examine their library. This most learned man, father of kings, Jawani, later wrote a careful book in which he detailed the organization of the assassins, whose name he attributed to the use of the drug hashish, which they were said to use in stupefying candidates for the ephemeral visit to paradise. It is possible that recruits were made in another way than by selecting gullible, fully grown youths. Legend has it that Hassan, once master of Alamut, used to buy unwanted children from their parents and train them in implicit obedience and with the sole desire to die in his service. Buzerg Umid, meaning Great Promise, the second Grand Master, Grand Master still used today, folks, maintained the power of the assassins on much the same pattern. Building new forts, gaining fresh converts, terrorizing those whom he did not want to have killed, and using them to further his design of world conquest. Sultan Sanjar of Persia, in spite of several expeditions against the viper's nest, as Agumat was now being called, could do little about him. Viper's nest was the term given by the assassin's enemies. The assassins themselves called it the eagle's nest. Ambassadors on each side were slain. A notable religious leader was captured by the assassins, given a mock trial, and flung into a furnace. The Grand Master, at this time, seldom put on the field more than 2,000 men at a time. But it must be remembered that they were killers, acting under an iron discipline, and more than a match for any organized army that they might ever have to face. Now the order began to spread in Syria, where the continued contact with the Crusaders was established. The warriors of the cross were in fairly effective control of an area extending from the Egyptian border to Armenia in the north. Bahram, a Persian leader of the assassin cult from Astrabad, gained control of a mighty fortress in Syria in the region known as the Valley of Demons, Wadi al Jan, and from there spread out from one fort to another. The Grand Prior, Bahram, now moved to an even more substantial fortified place, Masyat. Bahram's successor, Ishmael, the lash-bearer, planted a trained devotee on the saintly vizier of Baghdad, into whose confidence he worked his way to such an extent that this assassin, now called the Father of Trust, was actually made Grand Judge of Baghdad. The Crusaders had by now been about 30 years in the Holy Land, and the assassins decided that they could usefully form an alliance with them aimed against Baghdad. A secret treaty was therefore made between the Grand Master and Baldwin II, King of Jerusalem, whereby the Ishmaeli Grand Judge would have opened the gates of Baghdad treacherously to the Crusaders if the fortified city of Tyre were handed over to the assassins for their part in the transaction. Well, as with most plans, something went wrong. The judge had ordered an underling to open the city gates. This service had told the military commander of Damascus, who lost no time in killing the man, the Vigier, and 6,000 people believed to be secret assassins within the city. The Damascus garrison fell upon the crusaders and beat them back in a thunderstorm which the Christian warriors attributed to divine anger at their unworthy pact and the assassins as an attempt by the power of nature to allow the crusaders in the city 
under its cover. Meanwhile, the Grand Master was indulging in an orgy of destruction of individual rulers who opposed his creed. The list is interminable, but this is a fair example. Quote, the celebrated Aksumkur, Prince of Mosul, was a warrior equally dreaded by the Christians and the assassins. As this prince, on his return from Ma'ara Masrin, where the Moslem and Christian hosts had parted without venturing to engage, entered the mosque at Mosul to perform his devotions, he was attacked at the moment when he was about to take his usual seat by not one, but eight assassins, disguised as dervishes. Three of them fell below the blows of the valiant Emir, but ere his people could come to his aid, he had received his death wound and expired." Unquote. The fanaticism which inspired the killers was shared, it seemed, by other members of their families, who had been thoroughly trained in the bloody creed. For the historian Kamal Eldin relates, on this occasion when the mother of one of the youths who attempted Axunker's life heard that he had been slain, she painted her face and donned the gayest raiment and ornaments, rejoicing that her son had been found worthy to die the glorious death of a martyr in the cause of the imam. But when she saw him return alive and unscathed, she cut off her hair and blackened her countenance, and would not be comforted. Things thus continued for the fourteen years and a quarter of the second Grand Master's rule when he died to nominate his son, Kia Muhammad, as his successor. Under Muhammad, the killings continued. A part of the seacoast of Palestine came into assassin hands, and the cult leaders reaffirmed their overly belief in Orthodox Islam. In public, Ismailis were ordinary Muslims. The secret doctrine of the divinely guided leader was not to be discussed with the uninitiated. Don't miss tomorrow night's show. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. No matter what country you're in or what language you speak, welcome around the world to the hour of the time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Tonight, folks, I come to you with a heavy heart. For another one, actually two of my predictions, one has come true, one is about to come true. The one that has come true involved the loss of life and the injury of over 500 people. And of course I'm talking about the bombing of the World Trade Center in New York City. As far back as 1989 and ever since, I've been predicting major terrorist attacks upon the United States, the primary number one target, New York City. I've said it so many times, and so many people attending my lectures listening to my broadcast, and who have read my book, are familiar with it. I never, never enjoy being right when it involves the loss of life and human injury. Nevertheless, it is another chalk mark on the board, and I remain the most accurate predictor of future world events in the history of the world. But the one that is about to come true and has not yet is the prediction that I made that the United States would send troops to Yugoslavia. And it appears that that is going to happen in the very near future. Anyway, we will see, won't we? As we move into the new world order, and all of these events are planned to take us directly into one world totalitarian socialist government. To all those people in the city of New York who lost relatives, or who had friends or relatives that were injured, I offer you my deepest compassion, sympathy, and I wish that I could tell you that that was the end of it, but I can tell you that it is only the beginning. Unless people wake up, it will escalate, and there will be more. Don't forget, folks, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m., Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard 
in San Diego. I'll be there. I'll be giving a three-hour presentation entitled The Sacrificed King on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I will connect it directly to the occult worship of Mystery Babylon, the secret societies, and specifically to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, which really is just the outward form of the old Knights Templar. And I also believe, have reason to believe, that the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta was involved, which is just another branch of the old Templar Order. So make sure that you're there. $40 is the admission fee, unless you're a CAGI member, then the admission fee is $30. I managed to negotiate a 25% discount with the people who are putting this on and who have invited me to speak. If you're not a CAGI member, you can purchase advanced tickets at the Controversial Bookstore in San Diego. If you are a CAGI member, you must buy your tickets at the event. That's the only way that uh, we can get you the discount. If you like information on this whole conference, it's last the whole weekend. There's a lot of Looney Tunes stuff going on there. There are some good speakers. Uh, my workshop is is uh, Monday night, the last one of the whole conference, and it's not a workshop ticket, so it's a it's a separate event altogether. But you can call and find out about the whole thing just in case you want to go and spend the whole weekend. Call area code six one nine. 492-8588. That's 619-492-8588. And we still need donations to pay for this airtime, folks. Come on, get out your checkbooks and your money orders and help us out here. Send your donation to Stan and make the checks or money orders out to WWCR, not to me. I don't want your money. It goes to pay for airtime. That's it, period. Send them to Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Tell him Bill sent you. <laughs> and while you're at it, and even if you don't send a donation, write to Stan or call him. And uh, tell him you'd like to receive a packet of information. He'll be glad to send it to you. If you'd like to call him, his number is 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Please call him during normal waking hours. Stan's getting up there, and he likes to get his sleep, and I don't blame him. So... Please don't call him uh, late in the evening or late at night. Let him uh, have some, some of his own time. Call him during the day, during normal waking hours or early evening, please. Thank you very much for those of you who are doing that. Those of you who are not, please start. Well, let's continue where we left off. And uh, this is about the society in the Middle East known as the Assassins. And we covered quite a bit of their history already. But this secret society, the most successful of secret societies, showed that its strength ultimately depended upon a powerful leader. Well, Kia Muhammad was no such leader. And little by little it became obvious that his own son, Hassan the Hated, was the stronger personality. Now remember, Kia Muhammad was the old man of the mountain, and the mountain lair was called the Eagle's Nest. Now Hassan, through some magnetic power, was able to capture the imagination of the assassins, soon having it believed that he himself was none other than the power of all powers, the hidden imam, who had been mentioned by the first Grand Master, an incarnation of all greatness. So important was Hassan that he was the fountain of power, and others only held a very small measure of authority because he allowed them to have it for no other reason. 
This final absurdity was lapped up by members who had been conditioned to believe in things which were not, shall we say, exactly self-evident to the ordinary man. The doctrine of the all-powerful, invisible imam was a part of Ishmaelism, and Hassan was ready, even during his early manhood, to assume the role. But since his father was able to assert himself by having some 250 of Hassan's followers murdered, he thought it wiser to hold his hand. In 1163, his chance came. Muhammad died, and Hassan II issued an order to all Ishmaelis to collect below the castle of Alamut. Never before had such an assembly of killers, fanatics, and dedicated perverters of the truth been seen. Hassan, probably in a state of megalomania, assured them that he had received a message from the Almighty, that is, from now, all the bonds of religion were loose. Everyone might do as he liked. Later, in the modern age, we were to hear that again as, quote, the whole of the law shall be do as thou wilt, unquote. It was not necessary, he said, to keep up pretenses, and furthermore, he, Hassan, was none other than the hidden imam. His word was law, and he was a form of the divinity, not merely relaying instructions from above, but the divinity. Now, there was one further obstacle, folks. According to Ismaili doctrine, the hidden imam was to be of the family of Hashim, the blood of Muhammad the prophet. Such descendants were known and revered, and it was common knowledge that Hassan, too, was not one of them. He overcame this difficulty by stating that he was not, in fact, a true son of Kia Muhammad, the Persian, but an adopted child of the Caliphial family of Egypt. This pretense was carried on for four years, during which the crazed Hassan showed that he was not as mad as he might have been, by consolidating quite efficiently the power of the cult. Eventually, he was assassinated by his brother-in-law, Namwar the Famous. Now the father to son's succession seemed to be established. Muhammad II, son of Hassan II, began the cultivation of letters and sciences, which was to distinguish successive grandmasters of the order. It was a conceit of his in the time of the greatest flowering of Persian literature that he, he, was supreme among poets and philosophers. He used his assassins also to drive this point well home. The Imam Razi, one of the greatest thinkers of the time, refused to acknowledge the assassins as the most advanced theologians, so Muhammad II sent an envoy to him promising either a swift death by dagger or a pension of several thousand gold pieces a year. Suddenly, oh yes, suddenly, the learned Imam's discourses seemed to lose their bite. One day soon afterwards he was asked why he did not attack the assassins as of old. Because said the old man with a nervous glance around the assembly where a murderer might lurk. Their arguments are so sharp and pointed, and indeed they were. For thirty-five years, Mohammed II ruled the Ismailis with a rod of iron. The only law was that of obedience to the assassin will. The observances of ritual Islam were abolished. A new star had risen, remember that star? a power to stiffen resistance to crusader penetration. Saladin, who was to become an implacable foe of the assassins. The Syrian branch of the cult grew in power, while the activities of the eastern assassins were carried out much more quietly, with missionaries being sent to India, Afghanistan, even the remote Pamir Mountains which straddle China and Russia, where even today adherents of the sect are to be found. Saladin, had overcome the other Ismaili branch, the original home of assassin Egypt, and restored the true faith to the people of the Nile. He now had enough booty for ten years' war against the Crusaders in Palestine and troops to spare. His first task was to unify the forces of Islam, and this he determined to do by force, if necessary. 
Sinan, ancient of the assassin cult in Syria, decided to oppose this terrible enemy of the Fatimites. Three assassins fell upon Saladin and nearly killed him. This made the sect a priority target for the Saracen chief. The old man of the mountain, for his part, who was now Muhammad II, now unleashed a succession of fanatics in every kind of disguise upon Saladin. And by 1176, Saladin decided that an end must be put to the cult. He invaded their territory and started to lay it waste when the assassin chief offered him freedom of action to fight the crusaders and no, no further attempt upon his life if the cult were spared. Now these terms were agreed to in his fourth. No assassin ever again attempted to molest Sultan Saladin. This period introduces Sinan as yet another strange and terrible assassin leader. For he had decided that he was the incarnation of all power and deity, and that he would live the part. Sinan was never seen to eat or drink, sleep, or even to spit. Now, can you imagine this, a living human being, never seen to eat or drink, sleep, or even to spit? Between sunrise and sunset, he stood on a pinnacle of rock, dressed in a hair shirt, and preached his own power and glory to delighted assassins. Have you ever worn a hair shirt? Have you ever stood on a pinnacle of rock between sunrise and sunset? I mean, every sunrise and sunset? And wearing a hair shirt every sunrise and sunset? Well, folks, this is historic fact. This is not something that someone made up. Thus, at one and the same time, there were two chiefs of the order, each busily telling his own followers that he and he alone was God. Was God. Hassan in Persia, Sinan in Syria, each commanded legions of devoted killers, all committed by oath to follow his path. When Muhammad II died, he was succeeded by his son, Jaluddin, who completely reversed the orders that the assassins were to have no outward religious observances. You see, he felt that he could do a great deal by adopting the cloak of orthodox piety and sent ambassadors far and wide to announce his maintenance of the true faith. He went so far as to curse his predecessors publicly in order to convince the incredulous that such a people as the assassins could turn over a new leaf. As a result of what would today be called a long-term and comprehensive propaganda plan, he was acknowledged as a religious leader by half the orthodox monarchs of Islam and the first assassin to be so styled and came to be termed Prince Jalaluddin. Jalaluddin died in 1203 after 12 years of leadership of the cult, handing over to Aladdin, or Aladdin, and you guys thought that was just a storybook tale, didn't you? Aladdin, a child of nine years of age, weak, inefficient, stupid, Aladdin made little mark upon history, except in the classic tales of Arabia. The 1001 Arabian Nights. For Aladdin in the 1001 Arabian Nights is Aladdin, the leader of the assassins. It is said that his main activity was tending sheep, to which he was passionately attached, and he even had a small hut built in a sheepfold where he spent most of his time. Aladdin was extraordinarily cruel, in spite of the contact with the sheep, and continued to terrorize in time-honored fashion any person, great or small, who did not pay tribute or otherwise cooperate with the organization. And even today, those in power who are in contact with sheep most of the time <laughs> ultimately turn out to be the same. And we all know who the sheeple are, don't we? The assassin's hands, ears, and eyes were everywhere. Once fully initiated, a man might be sent to a place a thousand miles away to take up residence and live, waiting for the moment when orders came to him from Alamut to fulfill his fatal destiny, and all the while in between, furnishing intelligence to the central headquarters of the assassins. A story is told of the court of the Shah of Khwarezm, 
Thus, quote, the Ismaili ambassador spent some time with Vigier, one day after a splendid ban banquet, when the wine which they had been drinking in violation of the law, had mounted into their heads, the ambassador told Vigier, by way of confidence, that there were several Ishmaelis among the pages, grooms, guards, and other persons who were immediately about the sultan. The Vigier, dismayed, and at the same time curious to know who these dangerous attendants were, besought the ambassador to point them out to him, giving him his napkin as a pledge that nothing evil should happen to them. Instantly, at a sign from the envoy, five of the persons who were attendants in the chamber stepped forth, avowing themselves to be concealed assassins. On such a day, and at such an hour, said one of them, an Indian, to the vigier, I might have slain thee without being seen or punished, and if I did not do so, it was only because I had no orders from my superiors. Unquote. The vigier of course, begged for his life. But word got to the sultan, who ordered the assassins to be apprehended and burned alive. And the five chamberlains were cast on the flaming pyre, where they died exulting at being found worthy to suffer in the service of the great sheik of the mountain. So powerful was their devotion to the cult. The assassins had the last laugh, for an order arrived immediately afterwards from Alamut that the Shah must pay 10,000 pieces of gold as compensation for each man killed, which he did, or be killed himself. Another subsidiary activity which the assassins delighted in was the holding captive of Alamut of useful, rare, and distinguished personages who could be of value to them in educational, military, or other spheres. And one was a physician, another a famous astronomer, a third the greatest painter in Persia who worked to the order of the chief alone. The end of a chapter was near. For the Mongol hordes under Halaku, lieutenant of Chinggis were steadily destroying all the civilization of Islam which lay in their inexorable path westwards. Rukhnidin, son of Aladdin, succeeded him and tried at first to turn the Mongol tide. After a series of encounters, pitched battles, intrigues, and counter-intrigues, Rukhnidin was taken. He played for time as long as he could, but he was eventually murdered in his own turn by the victorious Mongol chief's men. Assassin power in Persia was broken, and what remained of the members were ordered, none knows by whom, to conceal their faith and await a signal that the cult was in full operation again. Alamut was silenced, and the Syrian headquarters alone remained. And if it had not been for the refusal of the Christian kings in Europe to send ambassadors to make a treaty or a new crusade with the Mongol horde, then all of Islam would have been decimated. But it was not. But the Christian kings, even though they would have liked to regain their foothold in the Middle East, had problems of their own and ignored the Mongol emissaries. It was a long time until the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt was able to overcome the Mongol thrust. In 1260, however, he carried the banners of Islam victoriously against them and restored the fortress of Alamut and other properties to the assassins, who were strongly surviving underground. They soon found that they had exchanged one master for another. For the Egyptians were now employing them for their own purposes and required them to undergo a new initiation, that of the ancient Egyptian mysteries of Babylon. Ivan Batuta, the great traveler of the 14th century, found them well entrenched in their former strong places, being used as the, quote, arrows of the Sultan of Egypt with which he reaches his enemies, unquote. The supposed suppression of the creed which followed the Mongol destruction did not, in fact, take place. Copying each other, historians <laughs> have asserted that assassinism died 600 years ago. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now and again, however, fresh 
facts of their continued existence still come to life. In the 18th century, an Englishman, the British consul at Aleppo in Syria, was at pains to make this better known. He said, quote, Some authors assert that these people were entirely extirpated in the 13th century by the Tartars, but I, who have lived so long in this infernal place, will venture to affirm that some of their spawns still exist in the mountains that surround us, for nothing is so cruel, barbarous, and execrable that is not acted and even gloried in by these cursed assassins, unquote. The assassins were widely dispersed throughout Asia. The rise of the thugs, the secret society of assassination of India, followed the Mongol invasion of Persia. Indeed, at least one of the thug recognition signals, Ali Baha'i Salam, indicates salutations to Ali, the descendant of the prophet most greatly revered by the assassins. Ishmaelis, not all of them recognizing the one chief, reside in places as far apart as Malaya, East Africa, and Salam. They would not necessarily feel that they are assassins in the same sense as the extremists who followed the old sheiks of the mountains, but at least some of them revere the descendants of the lords of Alamut to the extent of deification. The modern phase of Ishmaelism dates from 1810, when the French consul at Aleppo found that the assassins in Persia recognized as their divinely inspired chief a reputed descendant of the fourth grand master of Alamut, who then lived at Kek, a small village between Isfahan and Tehran. This Shah, Kalilullah, quote, was revered almost like a god and credited with the power of working miracles. The followers of Kalilullah would, when he pared his nails, fight for the clippings. The water in which he washed became holy water. The sect next appeared to the public gaze through an odd happening. In 1866, a law case was decided in Bombay. There is in that city a large community of commercial men known as Kohas. A Persian, the record tells us, Aga Khan, Mehalati, a native of Mehalat, a place situate near Kek, had sent an agent to Bombay to claim from the Kojas the annual tribute due from them to him and amounting to about 10,000 English pounds. The claim was resisted, and the British court was appealed to by Aga Khan. Sir Joseph Arnold investigated his claim. The Aga proved his pedigree, showing that he had descended in a direct line from the fourth Grand Master of Alamut, and Sir Joseph declared it proved. And it was further demonstrated by the trial that the Kohas were members of the ancient sect of the Assassins, to which sect they had been converted 400 years before by an Ishmaelite missionary who composed a work which has remained the sacred book of the Kohas. In the first Afghan war, the then Aga Khan contributed a force of light cavalry to the British forces. For this, he was awarded a pension. Hitti, in his History of the Arabs, notes, page 448 in 1951 edition, that the assassin sect known as Kohaz and Mawaz gave over a tenth of their revenues to the Aga Khan, who spends most of his time as a sportsman between Paris and London. The influence of the new form of organization and training, as well as initiatory techniques of the assassins upon later societies, has been remarked by a number of students, and I have found in my research that it's absolutely true. That the Crusaders knew a good deal about the Ishmaelis is shown from the detailed descriptions of them which survive. Esh Amir Ali, an Orientalist of considerable repute, goes further in his assessment. Quote, from the Ishmaelis, the Crusaders borrowed the conception which led to the formation of all the secret societies, religious and secular, of Europe. The institutions of Templars and Hospitalists, the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius Loyola, composed by a body of men whose devotion to their cause can hardly be surpassed in our time. The ferocious Dominicans, the milder Franciscans, may all be traced either to Cairo or to Alamut. The Knights Templar, especially with their system of Grand Masters, Grand Priors, and religious devotees, and their degrees of initiation, bear the strongest analogy to the Eastern Ishmaelis. We've got to take a break, folks. I'll be right back right after this short pause. In the year 1110, a mysterious order called the Priory de Sion appeared upon the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This mysterious secret order, the Priory de Sion, was eventually to crown the first king, the first Christian king of Jerusalem. When they appeared on the Temple Mount in 1110, they recruited nine knights 
to comb, to scour the Temple Mount, the passages and caverns and tunnels beneath for the ancient remains of the relics of the religion. Later, in A.D. 1118, nine knights, supposedly concerned for the welfare of pilgrims to the Holy Land, bound themselves together in the creation of a knightly order. This order, again, existing of nine knights, just like the original nine knights, were commissioned by the Priory de Sion. In under 200 years, folks, this organization had become one of the most powerful single entities, if not the greatest power ever to exist in Europe. They were the first international bankers, the first that ever existed in the world. A few years later, it was utterly destroyed. They say, however, as you're going to find out, they were not destroyed at all, but merely driven underground. The zeal of religion, the conditioning which made men support a dedicated cause with all of their might, was likewise the instrument of their destruction. Nothing less than religious fervor could have smashed the order as nothing less could have created it. And folks, you're going to find it difficult to believe, but the rise of this order and the destruction, at least publicly, of this order has such a great bearing on events today that you could say that everything that has happened since has been brought about by this one series of acts. Were the Knights Templar devil worshippers? Secret Saracens indulging in obscene orgies? Did they adore a head, spit on the cross, use the words Yala, which means literally in Arabic, O Allah, in their rituals? Did they learn their ways from the terrible sect of the assassins? Well, yes, folks, they did. And they are the link. At least in that day would have been considered the modern link between the ancient mystery religion of Babylon and Europe. For the religion had come to Europe long, long before the Templars ever emerged and made their appearance in the ancient worship of the sun by the Druids and the Celts and the tribes, the Germanic tribes, who had made their way thousands of years ago from the Middle East up through Asia, across Russia, and into Europe, they brought Mystery Babylon with them and practiced it as what we know now today as the pagan religion. And Stonehenge is actually an ancient Babylonian temple of the sun. And you will find how all this connects later. But the origin of this was lost, and the ability to control large numbers of people by the use of the hidden knowledge of the ages, was lost. It wasn't until the Knights Templar bought and brought the mystery religion of Babylon to Europe that the ancient, ancient worship of the sun again took hold amongst the Christian countries in the guise of Christianity, which was itself, at that time, I'm not talking about the teachings of Christ, now I'm talking about the perversion of the teachings of Christ, the melding of the teachings of Christ with the ancient worship of the sun, the mystery religion of Babylon, which became the Catholic Church, was indeed another branch of the ancient mystery religion of Babylon. That some of you out there may be confused from all of this. If you've been listening from the beginning of this series, then you're right on target. You're not confused. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you picked up this series somewhere in the middle, then you need to call Stan and order the studio quality tapes. They're in stereo. They're on TDK tapes. They are first quality tapes and crystal clear. 
You need to order this series from the first tape, the very first. And that was broadcast on February the 12th, I believe, a Friday. But anyway, Stan will know. Give him a call at 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Or write to Stan and ask him for an information packet at P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Now, folks, the original objective of the Order of the Temple, Knights Templar, which immediately became the subject of applause throughout Christendom, was to combine the two functions of monk and knight, to live chastely and fight the Saracens with the sword and spirit. The sweet mother of God, <clears throat> at least outwardly, they say, was chosen as their patroness, and they bound themselves to live in accordance with the rules of St. Augustine, electing as their first leader Hugh de Payens. Now, King Baldwin II granted them a part of his palace to live in and gave them a grant towards their upkeep. Now, the part of the palace that they lived in was actually an ancient mosque which was built upon the actual location of the old Temple of Solomon on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Knights nice Templar vowed to consecrate their swords, arms, strength, and lives to the defense of the mysteries of the Christian faith, to pay complete and utter obedience to the orders of the Grand Master, to fight whenever commanded, regardless of pearls, for the faith of Christ as they understood it. Among the vows taken were those which forbade their yielding even a foot of land to the enemy, whoever the enemy was, and not to retreat, even if attacked, in the proportion of three to one. They chose the name Militia Templi Soldiers of the Temple after the temple supposedly built by Solomon in Jerusalem near which they had been assigned quarters by the king but in reality had nothing to do with the Temple of Solomon. Some say that the Templars derived their idea of their order from that of the Hospitallers who looked after Catholic pilgrims to Palestine for there was little hospitality to be had from the native Orthodox Christians of those parts. Others hold that there was an even older order from which they received their inspiration. No reliable evidence on this point is, however, available according to the, quote, establishment, unquote, historians. Although for those who really, really research the true history of the secret orders, and specifically the Knights Templars, there's a direct connection to the assassins and the Roshaniya. Although the Templars were so poor that two men had to share a horse, they say, but that is not true at all, and their seal commemorated this decades after they became one of the richest communities of their time, they soon attracted favorable notice and support. Now, the two knights riding the horse was a symbol of sacrifice. It denoted their vows of poverty. In truth, each knight not only had a horse, but he had what they called a yeoman. He had a spare horse. He had a pack horse. And he had several horses in reserve. And a whole train of servants. But the Knights Templar were the first true, as we know it, in modern times. In modern times. There were others before. But they are the first true in modern times. By modern, I say from the time that Europe escaped from the old tribal paganism. In other words, in the year 1110, I consider that the beginning of the modern age, although historians may disagree with me, it's the beginning of everything that's ever happened since, and everything that's happening today can be traced right to the door of the Knights Templar. And that's why I say that. They were the first modern order to practice what we now know as true communism. They were the ones who brought international socialism into Europe, which has always been the tenet and the creed of the mystery religion of Babylon. Only one year after their establishment, 
Paul, Count of Andrew, who had come to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, joined as a married member and gave them an annual grant of 30 pounds of silver. This example was soon followed by other devout Western princes. For the first nine years of their existence, the knights continued to live a life of chastity and poverty in accordance with their vows. They adopted a striped white and black banner called the Busant, after their original piebald horse, and this word also became their battle cry. Special raiment they had none, and they wore whatever clothes were given to them by the pious, but little by little, as one writer puts it, they were to become haughty and insolent. And the black and white banner, the translation of the meaning of which was for the, again, exoteric, for the real meaning of black and white banner, was the meaning of the androgynous God, the positive, the negative, the black and the white, the yin and the yang. The male and the female combined into one, and that was the real meaning of the black and white banner. It is carried forth today on the floor of many of the temples of Freemasonry where the black and white checkered and pattern exists, and in one famous cathedral in Europe built by the Knights Templar. They disguised their esoteric religion in an exoteric manner that would be accepted by Christianity. Baldwin of Jerusalem, who had been a prisoner in the hands of the Saracens and knew of their disunity, realized at about this time that Islam must eventually unite against the Christian invasion, and he decided that the Templars would prove ideal allies in the battles which were to come. In 1127, therefore, he sent two Templars with his strong recommendation to the Pope, applying for official recognition of the order by the Holy See. And this is the first time that the Templars even were considered to be close to the center of religion, the Christian religion in that day, the Catholic Church, the Pope, for they were not commissioned as a Christian order. They were not commissioned by the Pope or by the Church. And this is a big myth that the Knights Templar started out to protect the Church and protect the pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. They were established first, primarily, and foremost as a branch of the ancient order of the religion of Mystery Babylon. And it's indicative of the strategies that they've used since to endear themselves to whatever the established power or the beliefs of the majority of the people might be. When they went to see the Pope, they had an introduction to St. Bernard himself, the abbot of Clairvaux, who was known to be an admirer of theirs and who was a nephew of one of their envoys. Then the Grand Master himself arrived in Europe and received the eulogistic opinion of the abbot. Quote, They go not headlong into battle, but with care and foresight, peacefully, as true children of Israel. But as soon as the fight is begun, they rush without delay upon the foe and know no fear. One is often put to flight a thousand, two, ten thousand, gentler than lambs and grimmer than lions. Theirs is the mildness of monks and the valor of the night. Unquote. Now, folks, this was a strong recommendation. And this testimonial was a part of the campaign to help the Templars in their efforts at recognition by the Pope. All of you who have thought that they began as a religious order in the first place, are so way off base that it's pathetic. And neither were the Jesuits a religious order in the first place, but we'll get that together in another broadcast. But on the 31st of January in the year 1128, the Master appeared before the Council of Troyes. Now this formidable body consisted of the Archbishops of Reims and Sins, ten bishops, and a number of abbots, including St. Bernard himself presided over by the Cardinal of Albano, the Papal Legate. They were approved, and Pope Honorius chose for them a white mantle, completely plain, 
The red cross was added by order of Pope Eugenius III in 1146. And see, you thought the Templars thought of this. Nope, not at all. This was mandated by two popes. First, a white mantle, completely plain, and then later, the red cross was added by order of Pope Eugenius III in 1146. Hugh de Payens now took his delegation through France and England and collected a number of recruits. Gifts and grants were showered upon the order. Lands, rents, and arms were forthcoming from all quarters. Richard I of England was enthusiastic about them. By 1133, King Alfonso of Aragon and Navarre, who had fought the Spanish Moors in 29 battles, had willed his country to them. Although when the Moors finally laid him low, his nobles prevented the Templars from claiming their rights, nevertheless, this was, was a great honor. In fact, to my knowledge and to our research into history, it had never before been done. In 1129, the Master, accompanied by 300 knights recruited from the noblest houses of Europe, led a huge train of pilgrims to the Holy Land. It was at this time that the Templars formed part of the Christian contingent, which, allied with the assassins, tried to take Damascus. And it wasn't the first time nor the last that the Christian Knights Templar, or supposedly Christian Knights Templar, they really weren't Christian at all, were allied with the assassins. Were they, as the Orientalist von Hammer alleges, connected in some secret way with the assassins? Yes. Our research shows that it is a historical fact. And it is also an historical fact that the assassins were prepared to adopt Christianity if they could gain greater power thereby. Christianity, that is, on the surface, just as the Knights Templar had done. Hammer points to the similarity of the two organizations. The followers of Hassan, Ibn Sabah, were in contact with the Templars and had a similar method of organization. They were in existence before the Templars were formed. The Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelians, or assassins, was the original. And folks, the order of the Templars was the copy. The balance of Western opinion is against this contention more particularly because one feels from wide reading of historians great sympathy is felt for the cruel, cruelly treated and arbitrarily disposed Templars. Thus, Kitely, who made a close study of the order, attacks those who would claim that the Templars were an assassin branch, but when you do research into the <laughs> associations and memberships of Kitely, you'll find that Kitely was himself a Knight Templar. And he said, quote, When nearly 30 years after their institution, the Pope gave them permission to wear a cross on their mantle, like the rival Hospitaller Order, no color could present itself so well suited to those who daily and hourly exposed themselves to martyrdom as that of blood, in which there was so much of what was symbolical. With respect to internal organization at will, we apprehend, be always found that this is for the most part of the growth of time and the product of circumstances, and is always nearly the same where these last are similar, unquote. And you find this kind of rhetoric and semantics all through the writings of those who wish to cover the true origin and the true meaning of Mystery Babylon. The famous question of the 3,000 gold pieces paid by the Syrian branch of the assassins to the Templars is another matter, which has, of course, never been settled. One opinion holds that this money was given as a tribute to the Christians, the other that it was a secret allowance from the larger to the smaller organization, which it really was, as the assassins wished to expand their control and remember their original goal was to take over the entire world by the systematic infiltration and control of each individual country. Those who think that the assassins were just fanatical Muslims and therefore would not form any alliance with those 
who to them were infidels, should be reminded that to the followers of the old man of the mountain, only he was right, and the Saracens who were fighting the holy war for Allah against the Crusaders were as bad as anyone else who did not accept the assassin doctrine. And it is true today. Quote, if you are not one of us, you are nothing. Unquote. Quote, the ends justify the means. Unquote. Quote, the strength of our order exists in the fact that we manifest ourselves under many different names and many different occupations and sometimes even seem to oppose ourselves. But at the highest level, we are of one mind, unquote. And I could go on and on and on, and you all know that I can go on and on and on. For I've studied this for so many years that I eat, drink, and sleep it. Oh, yes. Well, eventually grave charges against the Templars during the Crusades included the allegation that they were fighting for themselves alone. And more than one historical incident bears this out. The Christians had besieged the town of Ascalon in 1153 and were engaged upon burning down the walls with large piles of inflammable materials. Part of the wall fell after a whole night of this burning. The Christian army was about to enter when the master of the temple, Bernard de Tremelli, claimed the right to take the town himself. And this was because the first contingent into a conquered town had the whole spoils. As it happened, the garrison rallied and killed the Templars, closing the breach. There seemed good grounds for believing that the power which they had gained caused the Templars to devote their efforts as much as their own order's welfare as to the cause of the cross, in spite of their tremendous sacrifices for that cause. Having no loyalty to any territorial chief, they obeyed their master alone, and hence no softening political pressure could be put upon them. Well, this might well have led to an idea that they were an invisible superstate, and that is exactly the fact. But this does show some similarity with the invisible empire of the assassins. If none can deny their bravery, their high-handedness and exclusivity, in less than a hundred and fifty years after their founding gave them the reputation of considering themselves almost a law unto themselves. And now, dear listeners, we get into the meat the direct connection between the historical events and the events that are happening today. Don't miss even one episode of this series. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to the Hour of the Time. Well, folks, we've been getting calls from all over the nation, and even in some foreign countries, they have been worried. They've called Stan. His phone has been ringing off the hook. It seems some rather spurious and uh, ambitious individuals have been spreading the rumor by word of mouth, by the written word, and even on talk radio all across this country that I'm dead. Well, folks, Here's my answer to that. To all of my regular listeners and all the ships at sea around the world, it's me, William Cooper, speaking to you from the dead, where I have indeed seen the light, and I turned it off. One of the most disgraceful acts which stain the annals of the Templars, says even one of their ardent admirers, occurred in the year 1155, when Bertrand de Blancfort, whom William of Tyre calls a, quote, pious and God-fearing man, unquote, was master of the order. In a contest for the supreme power in Egypt, which the viziers bearing the proud title of Sultan exercised under the phantom caliphs, Sultan Abbas, who had put to death the caliph, his master found himself obliged to fly from before the vengeance of the incensed people with his harem, his own, and a great part of the royal treasures, he took his way through the desert. Well, a body of Christians, chiefly Templars, lay in wait for the fugitives 
near Ascalon. The resistance offered by the Moslems was slight and very ineffectual. Abbas himself was either, was either slain, or he fled, and his son, Nisardin, professed his desire to become a Christian. The far larger part of the booty, of course, fell to the Templars, but this did not satisfy their avarice. They sold Nisardin to his father's enemies for 60,000 pieces of gold. Now, if you think that's a lot of money in this day and age, it was a veritable king's ransom in that. And they stood by to see him bound hand and foot and placed in a sort of cage or iron latticed sedan on a camel to be conducted to Egypt, where a death by a protracted torture awaited him. It was not the Templars alone, folks, who were guilty of arrogance and worse. The Hospitallers had deteriorated from their first fine beginnings, and the annals of both orders are not innocent of unpleasantness, though they are indeed well filled with tales of glory. The Hospitallers, for instance, refused to pay tithes to the Patriarch of Jerusalem, even going so far as to erect immense buildings in front of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as a practical demonstration of their own importance. And when the patriarch entered his church, they rang their bells so loudly that he could not make himself heard. There is an occasion recorded when, quote, the congregation was assembled in church, the hospitallers rushed into it in arms and shot arrows among them as if they were robbers or infidels. These arrows were collected and hung up on Mount Cavalry, where Christ had been crucified, to the scandal of these recreant knights. On applying to Pope Adrian IV for redress, the Syrian clergy found him and his cardinals so prepossessed in favor of his enemies, bribed by them, in fact, as was said, that they had no chance of relief, unquote. This, then, folks, was the background of the rise of the Templars and the flavor of their environment. Now, if one adds to these elements the fact that various very heterodox sects, Gnostic, Manichae and the rest still lurked in the Holy Land, together with a great deal of magic and superstition of every kind, then there is a possibility, to say the least, that the Templars were infected by it. The facts indeed show that they were not only infected, but taken by it, and were initiated into not only the branch known as the Athens, but veritably arose from the secret sects in Syria. The contention which has been made that such heresies and archaic religions and practices did not survive until the Templar period is demonstrably false. Although much play has been made of it by those who would defend the order, for do such sects not endure there until this very day? Hmm? Well, this is not to say that the Templars were guilty of the practices which formed the substance of the confessions later to be wrung from them by barbaric torture, which we will examine in due course. But a secret tradition and magical rites may well have played a part in their hidden lore and practices. It should also be remembered, folks, that towards the end, there were Templars who were of actual Palestinian birth who would have every opportunity of absorbing the unorthodox beliefs of the many schools of a magical religious nature which existed in the area. The Grand Master, Philippe of Nablus, in 1167, for instance, was a Syrian, and many crusaders were Levantine lords, whatever their original blood, speaking Arabic with perfection. It was in 1162 that the Magna Carta of the Order was obtained by the Templars. The Bull Omni Datum optimum, often described as the keystone of their power. And through this instrument, they were able to consolidate their authority and preserve their secrets against intrusion. They were to find, too, that it did much to excite the envy of their opponents. Pope Adrian IV had died. The two rival popes were elected, Alexander III by the Sicilian group and Victor III by the Imperial Party. At first, the Templars acknowledged Victor, but in 1161, they switched their allegiance to Alexander. 
There was probably some sort of secret arrangement behind this, for by January 7th of the following year, the famous bull was issued. By the terms of this document, the Templars were released from all spiritual ties except to the Holy See itself. They were permitted to have special burial grounds in their own houses. They could have chaplains of their own. They had no tithes to pay, which in that day and age was miraculous, and were allowed to receive tithes, which was absolutely incredible. Nobody who had once entered the order could leave it except to join one with a stricter discipline. The stage, dear listeners, was set for clerical hatred of the Templars and Hospitallers, who had similar privileges, and in fact were one and the same, and still are today, although the advantages to the Pope from the combined support of these two orders could hardly be overestimated. In 1184, an incident occurred which inspired a great deal of distrust of the order, although the rarity of its occurrence should have underlined the fact that it was nothing of much consequence. You see, the English knight Robert of St. Albans left the Templars, became a Moslem, and led an army for Saladin against Jerusalem, then in the hands of the Franks. The charge against the Templars that they were secret Muslims or allies of the Saracens does not seem borne out by the fact that Saladin accused them of treacherous truth, breaking, and other crimes, and unlike his usual chivalrous self, took a solemn oath that he would ex execute such Templar captives as he could obtain as, quote, beyond the limits of Islam and infidelity alike, unquote. Nor did they make any attempt to invoke any religious bond with Saladin when they were captured, as we know from the Arabic Life of Saladin, written contemporaneously by his secretary, Qadi Yusuf. Strong evidence of this is given in the events which followed the terrible Battle of Hattin. Two years before, Saladin had made a pact with the assassins that they would give him a free hand to continue his holy war against the Franks, which we discussed on an earlier program. On July the 1st, 1187, he captured Tiberius. He attacked nearby Hittin at dawn on Friday, July the 3rd. 30,000 Christians, 30,000 Christians were captured, including the king of Jerusalem. No Templar. Not one is mentioned in the detailed Arab account as asking for mercy on religious or any other grounds. Although all knew that Saladin had, had issued a war cry, quote, Come to death, Templars, unquote. The Grand Master, Gerard of Rydcourt, and several other knights were among those taken. Saladin offered them their lives if they would see the light of the true faith. Well, according to history, none accepted and all these knights were beheaded except, admittedly, the Templar Grand Master. Could it be that he did accept the true faith? Or the light of the true faith, as Saladin had put it? A non-Templar, Reginald of Chateauan, tried to invoke the sacred code of Arab hospitality, and other crusaders claimed that they were Muslims and were spared. None of them were Templars or hospitalers. Reginald and the Templars collectively were sentenced to death for breaking the truth and the war crime of killing unarmed pilgrims to Mecca. Arab accounts include only a few references which could be construed as indicating any collusion with the Christian army. One says that on the Friday at midday, when the battle lasted for two days, Sultan Saladin issued the attack cry to be passed along the Saracen host, quote, On for Islam, unquote, at which the striped banner of the Templars was raised. And the Emir Lion of the Faith said, Are those Sultan Saladin Yusuf's allies of whom I have heard from the reconnaissance men? Well, this cannot be regarded as anything at all conclusive. The only other reference is to a body of Templars who went over to the Saracen side and whose supposed descendants survive to this day as the Salabiya, which means Crusader tribe, in North Arabia. This engagement, folks, felt the end of real Western power in Palestine for over 700 years, although it did stimulate the unsuccessful Third Crusade. Although the Templars and some other crusaders were still in the Holy Land, they had lost almost all of their possessions there. 
but in the West lay the real seat of their power. At this time, their European possessions numbered over 7,000 estates and foundations. Although principally concentrated in France and England, they had extensive properties in Portugal, Castile, Leon, Scotland, and Ireland, Germany, Italy, and Sicily. When Jerusalem was lost, their headquarters were transferred to Paris. This building, like all their branch churches, was known as the Temple. It was here that the French king Philip the Fair took refuge in 1306 to escape a civil commotion. It is said that this visit gave him his first insight into the real wealth of the order. Now remember, the wealth was not for the members, for they practiced the first true socialism, international socialism, or communism. The fabulous treasures which his host showed him, giving the bankrupt monarch the idea to plunder the knights on the pretext that they were dominated by heresies. Philippe the Fair was not entirely without some grounds for attacking the Templars. For in 1208 we find Pope Innocent III, a great friend of the order, censuring them publicly for, quote, causing their churches to be thrown open for mass to be said every day with loud ringing of bells, bearing the cross of Christ on their breasts, but not caring to follow his doctrines which forbid giving offense to the little ones who believe in him. Following the doctrines of demons, they affix their cross of the order upon the breast of every kind of scoundrel, asserting that whoever, by paying two or three pence a year, became one of their fraternity, could not, even if interdicted, be deprived of Christian burial. And thus they themselves, being captive to the devil, cease not to make captive the souls of the faithful, seeking to make alive those whom they knew to be dead. Unquote. The first sign of an attempt to bring some sort of physical restraint upon the Templars came from Henry III of England. For in 1252, he hinted that he might try to seize some of the property of the order. Quote, you prelates and religious, he said, especially you Templars and Hospitallers, have so many liberties and charters that your enormous possessions make you rave with pride and haughtiness. What was imprudently given must therefore be prudently revoked, and what was inconsiderately bestowed must be considerately recalled, unquote. Those were the words of the king. The master of the Templars immediately replied, quote, what sayest thou, O king? Far be it that thy mouth should utter so disagreeable and silly a word. So long as thou dost exercise justice, thou wilt reign. But if thou infringe it, thou wilt cease to be king. Unquote. Now remember that the Knights Templar at that time were the very first international bankers. They were the wealthiest order, wealthiest group then known in the world, even surpassing the kings of the different countries that existed. And even though the Hospitallers were created before the Knights Templar, eventually the two became the same order. Though to the public and to the rulers of Europe, they were different orders with different names. The haughty Templars of the 14th century owned land and revenues, gained steadily in honor and importance. They might have had thrones, had they wanted them, for such was their power towards the end that banded together, as one historian points out, they could have overcome more than one of the smaller countries of Europe. Perhaps, though, they aimed even higher than that. If their eventual aim was world hegemony, they could not have organized themselves better or planned their aristocratic hierarchy more thoroughly. And you will see that that's been carried over even onto the modern day. The pride, arrogance, and complete confidence and self-sufficiency of the order is something which shows through even the least inspired pages of the chroniclers. Their power was legendary. Everywhere they had churches, chapels, tithes, farms, villages, mills, rites of pasturage, of fishing, of venery, of wood. They had also in many places the right of holding annual fairs which were managed, and the tolls received by some of the brethren of the nearest houses or by their donates or servants. The number of their preceptories is, by the most moderate computation, rated at 9,000. 
the annual income of the order put at about six million pounds sterling, an unbelievable, unimaginable sum for those times. Masters of such a revenue descended from the noblest houses in Christendom, uniting in their purses the most esteemed secular and religious characters regarded as the chosen champions of Christ and the flower of Christian knights, it was not possible for the Templars in such lax times as the 12th and 13th centuries to escape falling into the vices of extravagant luxury and overweening pride. The order, folks, when fully developed, was composed of several classes. Chiefly knights, chaplains and serving brothers, Affiliated were those who were attached to the order and worked for it and received its protection without taking its vows, and this affiliation was said to be derived from the Arab Clientship Association, analogous to blood brotherhood and tribal associations. A candidate for knighthood should prove that he was of a knightly family and entitled, yes, entitled to the distinction. His father must have been a knight, or eligible to become one. He had to prove beyond any doubt that he was born in wedlock. The reason for this last requirement was said to be not only religious, there was the possibility that a political head, such as a king or prince, might influence the order by managing to have one of his bastard sons enter it, later perhaps to rise to high rank therein, and finally attaching it to the service of his dominion. The candidate for initiation had to be unmarried and free from all obligations, he should have made no vow nor entered any other order. And he was not to be in debt. Eventually, the competition for admission was so great from eligible people that a very high fee was exacted from those who were to be monk warriors of the temple. All candidates were to be knighted before entry into the order. But the period of probation which was originally demanded was before very long entirely abolished. No young man could be admitted until he was 21 years of age, because he was to be a soldier as well as a monk, and this was the minimum age at which he could bear arms. When a new knight was admitted to the order, the ceremony was held in secret. This fact and persistent rumors caused the belief that certain ceremonies and tenets were put into practice which deviated more than a little from the rituals of the church. The ceremony was held in one of the order's chapels in the presence of the assembled chapter alone. The master, or the prior, who took his place in chapels other than those at which he was present, opened the proceedings. Quote, Beloved brethren, ye see that the majority are agreed to receive this man as a brother. If there be any among you who knows anything of him on account of which he cannot lawfully become a brother, let him say it. For it is better that this should be signified beforehand than after he is brought before us. Unquote. And if no objection was lodged, the aspirant was sent to a small room with two or three experienced knights to coach him in what he had to know. Quote, Brother, are you desirous of being associated with the order? Unquote. If he agreed, they would dwell upon the trials and rigors of being a Templar. They would prepare him for initiation. He had to reply that for the sake of God he was willing to undergo anything and remain in the order for life. They asked him if he had a wife or was betrothed, and he made vows to any other order. Did he owe money more than he could pay? Was he of sound mind and body? Was he the servant of any person? Well, after satisfactory answers, the result was passed to the master. The assembled company was then asked again if they knew anything that might disqualify him, and if none objected, they were asked, Are you willing that he should be brought in in God's name? The knight answered, quote, Let him be brought in in God's name. Unquote. He was now again asked by his sponsors if he still desired to enter the order. Receiving an affirmative reply, they led him to the chapter, where he folded his hands and flung himself upon his knees. Quote, Sir, I am come before God and before you for the sake of God and our dear lady to admit me into your society and the good deeds of the order as one who will be all his life long the servant and slave of the order. Unquote. 
Beloved brother, answered the receptor, you are desirous of a great matter, for you see nothing but the outward shell of our order. Now let me repeat that again in case you weren't listening, folks. Beloved brother, answered the receptor, you are desirous of a great matter, for you see nothing but the outward shell of our order. It is only the outward shell, when you see that we have fine horses and rich comparison, that we eat and drink well and are splendidly clothed. From this you conclude that you will be well off with it, but you know not the rigorous maxims which are in our interior, for it is a hard matter for you, who are your own master, to become the servant of another. You will hardly be able to perform in future what you wish yourself, for when you may wish to be on this side of the sea, you will be sent to the other side. When you will wish to be in Acre, you will be sent to the district of Antioch, to Tripolis, or to Armenia, or you will be sent to Apulia, to Sicily, or to Lombardy, or to Burgundy, France. England, or any other country where we have houses and possessions, where we wish you to do our will. Further, he says, when you will wish to sleep, you will be ordered to watch. When you will wish to watch, then you will be ordered to go to bed. When you will wish to eat, then you will be ordered to do something else, and as both we and you might suffer great inconvenience from what you have may have concealed from us, look here on the holy evangelist and the word of God and answer the truth to the questions which we shall put to you. For if you lie, you will be perjured and may be expelled the order from which God keep you. Unquote. Now all the former questions were asked on holy writ. If the answers proved acceptable, the receptor continued. Quote, Beloved brother, take good care that you have spoken the truth to us, for should you have spoken false on any one point, you might be put out of the order from which God keep you. Now, beloved brother, attend strictly to what we shall say unto you. Do you promise to God and to our dear Lady Mary to be all your life long obedient to the master of the temple and to the prior who shall be set over you? Unquote. And the initiate answers with, Yea, sir, with the help of God. Again he is asked, Do you promise to God and to our dear Lady Mary to live chaste of your body all your life long? And he answers, Yea, sir, with the help of God. And he's again asked, Do you promise to God and to our dear Lady Mary to observe all your life long the laudable manners and customs of our order, both those which are already in use and those which the Master and Knights may add? And he answers, Yea, sir, with the help of God. And then he's asked, you promise to God and to our dear Lady Mary that you will, with the strength and powers which God has bestowed on you, help as long as you live to conquer the holy land of Jerusalem, and that you will with all your strength aid to keep and guard that which the Christians possess? And he answers, yea, sir, with the help of God. And he's asked, you promise to God and to our dear Lady Mary never to hold this or leave this order for stronger or weaker, for better or worse, then with the permission of the master or the chapter which has the authority? And he answers, yea, sir, with the help of God. And then he's asked, do you finally promise to God and to our dear Lady Mary never to be present when a Christian is unjustly and unlawfully despoiled of his heritage, and that you will never by counsel or by act take part therein? And he answers, yea, sir, with the help of God. And then... In the name, then, of God and our dear Lady Mary, and in the name of St. Peter of Rome and of our Father the Pope, and in the name of all the brethren of the temple, we receive to all the good works of the order which have been performed from the beginnings and shall be performed to the end. You, your father, your mother, and all of your family, whom you will let have share therein. In like manner, do you receive us to all the good works which you have performed and shall perform. We assure you of bread and water and the poor clothing of the order and labor and toil enow. Unquote. Then the candidate was admitted. Don't go away, folks. I'll be right back after this very short pause. With a joyous celebration, the candidate was admitted. The white mantle with its red cross was placed by the master over the neck of the candidate and clasped firmly by him. The chaplain recited the 132nd Psalm and the prayer of the Holy Ghost, and each brother repeated a paternoster. Then the master and the chaplain kissed the new entrant on the mouth. As he sat down before the master, the latter delivered him a sermon on his duties. Knights were equipped 
more lightly than other crusaders and were issued with shield, sword, lance, and mace. They were allocated three horses each, not one with two knights riding, but three horses each, plus an esquire who was either a serving brother or a layman, perhaps a youth from a noble family anxious to become a knight in his own turn. Retired knights were looked after by the order, became counselors at meetings, and were eventually buried in coffins in their Templar habit with the legs crossed. Many Templar gravestones show the knight with his feet upon a dog, but most show the crossed thigh bones and the skull, known as the skull and bones. The same skull and bones as the Russell Trust, the Brotherhood of Death at Yale, and the same skull and bones displayed upon the flag of the pirates. It was Philip the Fair of France, bankrupt and fearful of the growing power of the warriors of the temple who laid the conspiracy for the suppression of the order for all time. It has been hinted that Philip had some forewarning that a plot against the throne was afoot, that the Templars, frustrated in their attempts to win back the Holy Land, were about to turn upon Pope and King alike and try to overcome all Christendom. And believe it or not, that's closer to the truth than anything that you have ever heard about the Templars. In 1305, Pope Clement had been crowned through the assistance of the French king and was actually under the control of the French king. And Philip was ready to bring all the power of church and state against the Knights of the Temple. There had been continued rivalry between the Templars and the Hospitallers on the surface. Underneath, they were one and the same. And Clement, six months after his enthronement, wrote asking them to visit him for a conference, ostensibly for the purpose of making plans for aiding the kings of Armenia and Cyprus. The Pope was, however, hoping that he could effect a reconciliation between the two orders, which would in turn strengthen his own position as their only ultimate head. William de Villaret, master of the hospital, was fully engaged in an attack upon the Saracens of Rhodes when the invitation arrived and could not obey it. But Jacques de Valais, Grand Master of the Temple, decided to accept. He handed over the defense of Limassol and Cyprus to the Order's Marshal, collected sixty knights, packed one hundred and fifty thousand gold florins plus much other treasure, and set sail for France. At Paris, de Valais was received with honors by the king who was plotting his downfall. In Poitiers, he met Clement and discussed the possibilities of a fresh crusade. De Molay opined that only a complete alliance of all Christendom could be of any avail against the Moslems and that the amalgamation of the two orders was not a good idea. The Grand Master returned to Paris, and almost at once rumors began to circulate about certain serious charges to be preferred against the order. Troubled at this campaign, the master, together with Rimbaud de Caron, preceptor of Altremere, Geoffrey de Gonville, preceptor of Aquitaine, and Hugh de Parado, preceptor of France, returned to Poitiers to justify the order before the Pope. An audience took place about April of 1307 in which the Pope mentioned the charges which had been made. The commission understood that their answer satisfied Clement and returned to the capital in good heart. But this, dear listeners, was only the beginning. The method by which the charges were originally said to have been made was through a former Templar who had been expelled from the order for heresy and other offenses. The Squin de Flexian found himself in prison, together with another man, a Florentine named Nofo Die and they thought or were told that they could obtain their release and a pardon for the crime of which they were currently accused if only they would testify against the order. One account has it that Deflexian called for the governor of the prisoner, saying that he had a disclosure to make which he could tell the king personally, and which would be more to him than the conquest of an entire kingdom. Another chronicle has it that both men were degraded Templars and had been actively engaged in the revolt against the king during which Philip had been forced to take refuge with the Templars. It is further stated that Cardinal Cantalupo, the Chamberlain to the Pope, who had been in association with the Templars since he was eleven years old, had confessed some of their doings to his master. 
Ten main charges were made by Deflexium against the order. One, each Templar, on his admission, swore never to quit the order and to further its interest by right or wrong. Two, the heads of the order are in secret alliance with the Saracens, and they have more of Mohammedan infidelity than Christian faith. And proof of the latter includes that they make every novice spit upon the cross and trample upon it and blaspheme the faith of Christ in various ways. Three, the heads of the order are heretical, cruel, and sacrilegious men. Whenever any novice, on discovering the iniquity of the order, tries to leave it, they kill him and bury the body secretly by night. They teach women who are pregnant by them how to procure abortion and secretly murder such newborn children. Four, they are infected with the errors of the Fraticelli. They despise the Pope and the authority of the Church. They scorn the sacraments, especially those of penance and confession. They pretend to comply with the rites of the Church simply to avoid detection. Five, the superiors are addicted to the most infamous excesses of debauchery. If anyone expresses his repugnance to this, he is punished by perpetual captivity. Six, the temple houses are the receptacle of every crime and abomination that can be committed. Seven, the order works to put the Holy Land into the hands of the Saracens and favors them more than the Christians. Eight, the master is installed in secret, and few of the younger brethren are present at this ceremony. It is strongly suspected that on this occasion he repudiates the Christian faith or does something contrary to right. Nine, many statues of the order are unlawful, profane, and contrary to Christianity. In fact, some of them are stone penises. The members are therefore forbidden under pain of perpetual confinement to reveal them to anyone. Ten, no vice or crime committed for the honor or benefit of the order is held to be a sin. Now these charges were later augmented by others which were collected through testimony from other enemies of the order, and included such assertions as the use of the phrase, Ya Allah, which means, O Allah, and the adoration of an idol called the Head of Baphomet. In fact, the head of Baphomet was not an idol that they worshipped, but represented the, the receptacle of the intelligence, or the seat of intelligence, the brain. The light, Lucifer, the gift of intellect, primordial knowing, and that is what really the object of veneration was. Philip and his advisors prepared in great secrecy for the descent upon this powerful organization, the Knights Templar, and on the 12th of September, 1307, sealed letters were sent to all the governors and royal officers throughout France, instructing them to arm themselves on the 12th of the next month and open the sealed orders, and to act upon them forthwith by the morning of Friday, October the 13th. And on that date... Almost every Templar in France was in the hands of the king's men. And thus was born the legend that Friday the 13th is an unlucky day. And notice that it was October Friday the 13th, the very first October surprise. Hardly one seems to have had any warning. But they did, because before the king acted, the Templars had moved their wealth, their treasure, their holdings out of the country of France. On the day before his arrest, the Grand Master had actually been chosen by the king to be a pallbearer at a state funeral. The secret orders had it that all Templars were to be seized, tortured, and interrogated. Confessions were to be obtained from them. Pardon might be promised only if they confessed and all their goods were to be expropriated. But the only thing that they really got were the actual real estate property held by the Templars in France and nowhere else. None of the gold, none of their wealth, none of their jewels, none of their treasures, none of the relics that they had recovered from the Holy Land were ever found. The king himself took possession of the temple at Paris as soon as the Grand Master and his knights were arrested. The next day, the University of Paris assembled, together with canons and other functionaries and ministers, and the chancellor declared that the knights had been proceeded against for heresy. 
Two days later, the university met in the temple, and some heads of the order, including the Grand Master, were interrogated. They are said to have confessed to 40 years' guilt, whatever that means. Now, whether Dean Lay and others confessed on that occasion or not, the king was emboldened to publish an accusation in which he called the knights polluters of the air and devouring wolves. A public meeting was called in the royal gardens and addressed by monks and representatives on this subject. Edward II was the son-in-law of the French Philippe, and to him was sent a priest who invited the English monarch to act at once against the order in Britain. Well, Edward almost at once wrote to say that the charges seemed to him to be incredible. But Pope Clement wrote on November the 22nd to London, assuring Edward that the master of the temple had confessed of his own free will, that knights on their admission to the order denied Christ, others had admitted idolatry and other crimes. He therefore called upon the king of England to arrest all tempers within his domains and to place their lands and goods in custody until their guilt or innocence should be ascertained. He condemned them to torture by the Dominican monks under the Inquisition until they confessed their guilt or were dead. Now notice the date, folks. November the 22nd in the year 1307. That's a significant date in our history and has direct bearing, as you will see, many hours down the line. Or you can see right now, if you attend my lecture in San Diego on March the 15th at 8 p.m. at the... Let me see here. Where is it at? At the Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard, San Diego, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. Or right, you can call Stan and find out how to order our tape, The Sacrifice King, or my Atlanta lecture, which is over seven hours long, including all of the Kennedy material. <laughs> I bet you knew I was talking about Kennedy's assassination, didn't you? Well, this has direct bearing, as you shall see, eventually. Eventually, you shall know what it all means. You'll be able to put it all together. Before the King of England received this missive, he seems to have been sorely troubled by the allegations. He wrote on November the 26th to the Seneschal of Egan asking about the charges. On the 4th of December, he wrote to the kings of Portugal, Castile, Aragon, and Sicily asking, quote, what they had heard, and adding that he had given no credit to it, unquote. He wrote to the Pope himself on December the 10th, expressing disbelief of what the French king said, and begging his holiness to institute an inquiry. Well, folks, by December the 15th, when the papal bull arrived, Edward felt he must act upon it without question. On December the 26th, he wrote to the Pope that his orders would be obeyed, but in the interim, Edward had sent word to Wales, Scotland, and Ireland that the Templars were all to be seized, as in England, but they were to be treated with kindness. On October the 19th, less than a week after they had been arrested in France, 140 prisoners were being tortured by the Dominican Imbert in the Paris Temple. Promises and the rack produced many confessions. Thirty-six of the examinees died during these proceedings. Throughout France, the racks worked overtime and the confessions poured forth. Many good men were crippled for the rest of their life. Many of these were contradictory and confused, and perhaps there is little wonder of that. How many of you could resist even for five minutes the tortures of the medieval Inquisition? The Pope now seemed a little uneasy at the arbitrary methods which were being employed. Philippe wrote sharply to him, saying that he, the king, was doing God's work and rendered accounts to God alone. He offered to turn over all the goods of the Templars to the service of the Holy Land. Clement, still a weakling, merely stipulated that the inquisitions of each bishop should be confirmed by a provincial council, and that the examination of the heads of the order should be reserved to himself. Now we hear a constant succession of confessions and retractions, allegations that the heads of the order confessed completely and spontaneously to the Pope himself. 
The Pope himself, for some unexplained reason, folks, tried to escape to Bordeaux, but was stopped by the king. Now, he was the monarch's captive, as well as his creation. Detailed confessions of individual Templars have been kept on record, many of them undoubtedly obtained by extreme racking and other tortures. The Templars, who were prepared to defend the order in court, were brought to Paris, to the number of 546, deprived of their nightly habits and the sacraments of the church. They had no means to acquire defense counsel. Their numbers rose to 900, and now they clamored for the presence of the Grand Master who was held elsewhere. An act of accusation in the name of the Pope was drawn up, and 75 Templars drew up the defense. The accusation had it now that, quote, at the time of their reception they were made to deny God, Christ, the Virgin, etc., and in particular to declare that Christ was not the true God, but a false prophet who had been crucified for his own crimes and not for the redemption of the world. They spat and trampled upon the cross, especially on Good Friday. They worshipped a cat, which sometimes appeared in their chapters. Their priests, when celebrating Mass, did not pronounce the words of consecration. They believed that their master could absolve them from their sins. They were told at their reception that they might abandon themselves to all kinds of licentiousness. They had idols in all their provinces, some with three faces, some with one. They worshipped these idols in their chapters, believed that they could save them, regarded them as the givers of wealth to the order and of fertility to the earth. They touched them with cords which they afterward tied around their own bodies underneath their robes, and that is still practiced today by Freemasons and by the Mormon Church. Those who at the time of their reception would not comply with these practices were put to death or imprisoned. The reply of the Templars denied every charge and stated that they had been subjected to every kind of illegality since their arrest. Fifty-four of the knights who had volunteered to defend the order were committed to the flames, having been declared relapsed heretics before the trials had even started. And you'll see this number 54 crop up later, and even in the modern day. And sometimes it's 54 plus one, the Grand Master, who later was burned at the stake. Four years to the day after the first arrests, the Pope led a convocation of 114 bishops to come to a final decision about the Templar order. Well, folks, the prelates of Spain, England, Germany, Denmark, Ireland, and Scotland called for the Templars to be allowed to defend themselves. The Pope retorted by closing the session almost at once. He would not hear of it. Out of 1,500 to 2,000 Templars who were in hiding in the vicinity, nine knights actually came forward to testify for the order. The Pope doubled his guard and sent a message to the king to do the same. As there was still danger from the hidden knights, they were not heard. Only one Italian prelate and three French ones voted to prevent the order from putting in its defense. Now, Philippe, deciding that something should be done to hasten affairs, set off for Venice in the conference. His arrival had an electric effect. On his sole authority, the Pope almost immediately abolished the order in a secret consistory. And this was on March the 22nd, in the year 1313. And 1313 plays a significant number later on, as that was a famous address in New Orleans. As some of you may remember... On May the 2nd, when the bull was published, the order ceased officially to exist. The Grand Master, assumed but not proved to be guilty, was sentenced to perpetual imprisonment. Most of the other knights were released, and many of these passed their remaining days in poverty. De Molay and one of his chiefs, Guy of Auvergne, pronounced or proclaimed their innocence on the public stage to which they had been taken to have sentence announced. The king, upon hearing them recant their confession, immediately had them committed to the flames. And some say that while he was being burned at the stake, that de Molay cursed both the Pope and the King of France, stating that within a certain short period of time, 
He would meet them. He would meet them in another life in front of God who would judge them for their crimes. And believe it or not, folks, well within the period of time, which was not very long, both the Pope and the King of France were dead, and I'm sure joined Jacques de Molay in front of God for their final judgment. We are in no way finished with the story of the Knights Templar. But until tomorrow night, good night, and God bless each and every one of you. Get comfortable, ladies and gentlemen. Open your ears, sit back and relax, and get set for an unbelievable revelation tonight. You're going to want copies of this tape, this tape of The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ah, yes, the seed that lies beneath the snow in the springtime becomes the rose. I'm going to begin tonight's broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, by reading a portion of the introduction of a book entitled Born in Blood by John J. Robinson, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. Now, you should seek out this book, purchase it, and read it. It is a wonderful addition to your own library. And I begin now. Quote, The research behind this book was not originally intended to reveal anything about Freemasonry or the Knights Templar. Its objective had been to satisfy my own curiosity about certain unexplained aspects of the Peasants' Revolt in England in 1381, a savage uprising that saw upwards of a hundred thousand Englishmen march on London. They moved in uncontrolled rage, burning down manor houses, breaking open prisons, and cutting down any who stood in their way. One unsolved mystery of that revolt was the organization behind it. For several years, a group of disgruntled priests of the lower clergy had traveled to the towns, preaching against the riches and corruption of the church. During the months before the uprising, Secret meetings had been held throughout central England by men weaving a network of communication. After the revolt was put down, rebel leaders confessed to being agents of a, quote, great society, unquote, said to be based in London. So very little is known of that alleged organization that several scholars have solved the mystery simply by deciding that no such secret society ever existed. Another mystery was the concentrated and especially vicious attacks on the religious order of the Knights Hospitaller of St. John, now known as the Knights of Malta. Not only did the rebels seek out their property for vandalism and fire, but their prior was dragged from the Tower of London to have his head struck off and placed on London Bridge to the delight of the cheering mob. There was no question that the ferocity unleashed on the crusading Hospitallers had a purpose behind it. One captured rebel leader, when asked the reasons for the revolt, said, quote, First and above all, the destruction of the Hospitallers, unquote. What kind of secret society could have had that special hatred as one of its primary purposes? A desire for vengeance against the Hospitallers was easy to identify in the rival crusading order of the Knights of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. The problem was that those knights temper had been completely suppressed almost 70 years before the peasants' revolt, following several years during which the Templars had been imprisoned, tortured, and burned at the stake. After issuing the decree that put an end to the Templar order, Pope Clement V had directed that all of the extensive properties of the Templars should be given to the Hospitallers. Could a Templar desire for revenge actually have survived underground for three generations? There was no incontrovertible proof, yet the only evidence suggests the existence of just one secret society in 14th century England. Just one. The society that was or would become the order of free and accepted Masons. There appeared to be no connection, however, between the revolt and Freemasonry, except for the name or title of its leader. He occupied the center stage of English history for just eight days, and nothing is known of him except that he was the supreme commander of the rebellion. He was called Walter 
the Tyler. And it seemed at first to be mere coincidence that he bore the title of the enforcement officer of the Masonic Lodge. In Freemasonry, the Tyler, who must be a master mason, is the sentry, the sergeant at arms, and the officer who screens the credentials of visitors who seek entrance to the lodge. In remembrance of an earlier, more dangerous time, his post is just outside the door of the lodge room, where he stands with a drawn sword in his hand even to this day. I was aware that there had been many attempts in the past to link the Freemasons with the Knights Temper, but never with success. The fragile evidence advanced by proponents of that connection had never held up, sometimes because it was based on wild speculation, and at least once because it had been based on a deliberate forgery. But despite the failures to establish that link, it just will not go away, and the time-shrouded belief in some relationship between the two orders remains as one of the more durable legends of Freemasonry. That is entirely appropriate, because all of the various theories of the origins of Freemasonry are legendary. Not one of them is supported by any universally accepted evidence. Ah, here I break from reading from the introduction of the book and interject a comment here. There was never any universally accepted evidence until you hear what you're going to hear tonight produced by John Galt, an agent of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence. The connection, dear listeners, is in the genealogy of the families of the elite. You are going to be amazed, and now I continue from the introduction to Born in Blood. I was not about to travel down that time-worn trail and decided to concentrate my efforts on digging deeper into the history of the Knights Templar to see if there was any link between the suppressed Knights and the secret society behind the Peasants' Revolt. In doing so, I thought that I would be leaving Freemasonry far behind, and I couldn't have been more mistaken. Like anyone curious about medieval history, I had developed an interest in the Crusades, and perhaps more than just an interest. Those holy wars hold an appeal that is frequently as romantic as it is historical, and in my travels I had tried to drink in the atmosphere of the narrow defiles in the mountains of Lebanon through which crusader armies had passed, and had sat staring at the castle ruins around Sedan and Tyre, trying to hear the clashing sounds of attack and defense. I had marveled at the walls of Constantinople, and had strolled the arsenal of Venice, where crusader fleets were assembled. I had sat in the round church of the Knights Templar in London, trying to imagine the ceremony of its consecration by the Patriarch of Jerusalem in 1185, more than 300 years before Columbus set sail west to the Indies. The Templar Order was founded in Jerusalem in 1118 in the aftermath of the First Crusade. Its name came from the location of its first headquarters on the site of the ancient Temple of Solomon, helping to fulfill a desperate need for a standing army in the Holy Land. The Knights of the Temple soon grew in numbers, in wealth, and in political power. They also grew in arrogance and the Grand Master de Radford was a key figure in the mistakes that led to the fall of Jerusalem in 1187. The Latin Christians managed to hold on to a narrow strip of territory along the coast where the Templars were among the largest owners of the land and the fortifications. Finally, the enthusiasm for sending men and money to the Holy Land wand among the European kingdoms, which were preoccupied with their own wars against each other. By 1296, the Egyptian sultan was able to push the resident crusaders, along with the military orders, into the sea. The Holy Land was lost. And the defeated Knights Templar moved their base to the island kingdom of Cyprus, dreaming of yet one more crusade to restore their past glory. As the Templars planned a new crusade against the infidel, King Philip IV of France was planning his own private crusade against the Templars. He longed to be rid of his massive debts to the Templar Order, which had used its wealth to establish a major international banking operation. Philip wanted the Templar treasure to finance his continental wars against Edward I of England. 
After two decades of fighting, England on one side and the Holy Roman Church on the other, two unrelated events gave Philip of France the opportunity he needed. Edward I died, and his deplorably weak son took the throne of England as Edward II. On the other front, Philip was able to get his own man on the throne of Peter as Pope Clement V. When word arrived on Cyprus that the new pope would mount a crusade, the Knights Templar thought that their time of restoration to glory was at hand. Summoned to France, their aging grandmaster, Jacques de Molay, went armed with elaborate plans for the rescue of Jerusalem. In Paris, he was humored and honored until the fatal day. At dawn, on Friday the 13th of October, in the year 1307, every Templar in France was arrested and put in chains on Philip's orders. Their hideous torture for confessions of heresy began immediately. When the Pope's orders to arrest the Templars arrived at the English court, young Edward II took no action at all. He protested to the pontiff that the Templars were innocent. Only after the Pope issued a formal bull on November the 22nd in the year 1307 was the English king forced to act. In January in the year 1308, Edward finally issued orders for the arrest of the Knights Templar in England. But the three months of warning had been put to good use. Many of the Templars had gone underground, while some of those arrested managed to escape. Their treasure, their jeweled reliquaries, even the bulk of their records, had totally disappeared. In Scotland, the papal order was not even published. Under those conditions, England, and especially Scotland, became targeted havens for fugitive Templars from continental Europe. And the efficiency of their concealment spoke to some assistance from outside, or from each other. The English throne passed from Edward II to Edward III, who bequeathed the crown to his ten-year-old grandson, who, as Richard II watched from the tower as the peasants' revolt exploded throughout the city of London. Much had happened to the English people along the way. Incessant wars had drained most of the king's treasury, and corruption had taken the rest. A third of the population had perished in the Black Death, and famine exacted further tolls. The reduced labor force of farmers and craftsmen found that they could earn more for their labor, but their increased income came at the expense of land-owning barons and bishops, who were not prepared to tolerate such a state of affairs. Laws were passed to reduce wages and prices to pre-plague levels, and genealogies were searched to reimpose the bondage of serfdom and billionage on men who thought themselves free. The king's need for money to fight his French wars inspired new and ingenious taxes. The oppression was coming from all sides, and the pot of rebellion was brought to the boil. Religion didn't help either. The land-owning church was as merciless a master as the land-owning nobility. Religion would have been a source of confusion for the fugitive tempers as well. They were a religious body of warrior monks who owed allegiance to no man on earth, except the Holy Father, according to the Holy Father, but according to the Templars, in secret, their allegiance was only to themselves. When their Pope turned on them, chained them, beat them, he broke their link with God. In 14th century Europe, there was no pathway to God except through the Vicar of Christ on earth. If the Pope rejected the Templars, and the Templars rejected the Pope, they had to find a new way to worship their God, at a time when any variation from the teachings of the established church was blasted as heresy. That dilemma calls to mind the central tenet of Freemasonry, which requires only that a man believe in a supreme being, with no requirements as to how he worships the deity of his choice. In Catholic Britain, such a belief would have been a crime, but it would have accommodated the fugitive Templars who had been cut off from the universal church. In consideration of the extreme punishment for heresy, such an independent belief also made sense of one of the more mysterious of Freemasonry's old charges, the ancient rules that still govern the conduct of the fraternity. The charge says that no Mason should reveal the secrets of a brother that may deprive him of his life and property. 
That connection caused me to take a different look at the Masonic old charges. They took on new direction and meaning when viewed as a set of instructions for a secret society created to assist and protect fraternal brothers on the run and in hiding from the church. That characterization made no sense in the context of a medieval guild of stonemasons, the usual claim for the roots of Freemasonry. It did make a great deal of sense, however, for men such as the fugitive Templars whose very lives depended upon their concealment. Nor would there have been any problem in finding new recruits over the years ahead. There were to be plenty of protesters and dissidents against the church among future generations. The rebels of the Peasants' Revolt proved that when they attacked abbeys and monasteries, and when they cut the head off the Archbishop of Canterbury, the leading Catholic prelate in England. The fugitive Templars would have needed a code such as the old charges of masonry, but the working stonemasons clearly did not. It had become obvious that I needed to know more about the ancient order of free and accepted masons. The extent of the Masonic material available at large public libraries surprised me, as did the fact that it was housed in the Department of Education and Religion. Not content with just what was generally available to the public, I asked to use the library in the Masonic Temple in Cincinnati, Ohio. By the way, folks, Cincinnati, Ohio is an extremely important location in this country, the United States. I told the gentleman there that I was not a Freemason, but wanted to use the library as part of my research for a book that would probably include a new examination of the Masonic Order. His only question to me was, quote, will it be fair, unquote. I assured him that I had no desire or intention to be anything other than fair, to which he replied, quote, good enough, unquote. I was left alone with the catalog and the hundreds of Masonic books that lined the walls. I also took advantage of the publications of the Masonic Service Association at Silver Springs, Maryland. Later, as my growing knowledge of Masonry enabled me to sustain a conversation on the subject, I began to talk to Freemasons. At first, I wondered how I would go about meeting 15 or 20 Masons, and if I could meet them, would they be willing to talk to me? The first problem was solved as soon as I started asking friends and associates if they were Masons. There were four in one group I had known for about five years, and many more among men I had known for 20 years and more, without ever realizing that they had any connection with Freemasonry. As for the second part of my concern, I found them quite willing to talk not about the secret passwords and hand grips, by then I already knew them, but about what they had been taught concerning the origins of Freemasonry and its ancient old charges. They were as intrigued as I about the possibilities of discovering the lost meanings of words, symbols, and ritual for which no logical explanation was available such as why a Master Mason is told in his initiation rites that, quote, this degree will make you a brother to pirates and corsairs, unquote. And folks, I'll explain that to you <laughs> a little later. We agreed that unlocking the secrets of those Masonic mysteries would contribute most to unearthing the past, because the loss of their true meanings had caused the ancient terms and symbols to be preserved intact, less subject to change over the centuries or by adaptations to new conditions. Among those lost secrets were the meanings of words used in the Masonic rituals, words like Tyler, Cohen, Dugard, and Jewess. Masonic writers have struggled for centuries without success to make those words fit with their preconceived conviction that Masonry was born in the English-speaking guilds of medieval stonemasons. Now, I would test the possibility that there was indeed a connection between Freemasonry and the French-speaking Templar order by looking for the lost meanings of those terms, not in English, but in medieval French. The answers began to flow, and soon a sensible meaning for every one of the mysterious Masonic terms was established in the French language. It even provided the first credible meaning for the name of Hiram Abiff, the murdered architect of the Temple of Solomon, who is the central figure of Masonic ritual. The examination established something else as well. It is well known that in 1362 the English courts officially changed the language used for court proceedings from French to English. So the French roots of all the mysterious terms of Freemasonry confirmed the existence of that secret society in the 14th century. 
the century of the Templar suppression and the peasants' revolt. With that encouragement, I addressed other lost secrets of masonry, the circle and mosaic pavement on the lodge room, floor, gloves and ramskin aprons, the symbol of the compass in the square, even the mysterious legend of the murder of Hiram Abiff. The rule, customs, and traditions of the Templars provided answers to all of those mysteries. Next came a deeper analysis of the old charges of ancient masonry that define a secret society of mutual protection. What the, quote, lodge, unquote, was doing was assisting brothers in hiding from the wrath of church and state, providing them with money, vouching for them with the authorities, even providing the, quote, lodging, unquote, that gave Freemasonry the unique, unique term for its chapters and their meeting rooms. There remained no reasonable doubt in my mind that the original concept of the secret society that came to call itself Freemasonry had been born as a society of mutual protection among fugitive Templars and their associates in Britain, men who had gone underground to escape the imprisonment and torture that had been ordered for them by Pope Clement V. Their antagonism toward the Church was rendered more powerful by its total secrecy. The suppression of the Templar order appeared to be one of the biggest mistakes the Holy See has ever made. In return, Freemasonry has been the target of more angry papal bulls and encyclicals than any other secular organization in Christian history. Those condemnations began just a few years after Masonry revealed itself in 1717 and grew in intensity, culminating in the bull Humanum Genus, promulgated by Pope Leo XIII in 1884. In it, the Masons are accused of espousing religious freedom, the separation of church and state, the education of children by laymen, and the extraordinary crime of believing that people have the right to make their own laws and to elect their own government. Quote, according to the new principles of liberty, unquote. You see, folks, and this is an aside, all of our forefathers who established this country were Freemasons, and their intent is spelled out in Latin on the reverse of the great seal of the United States of America, where it plainly says, Novus Ordo Cyclorum, the New World Order. And I will interpret all of the meaning of the symbols on that great seal according to their true meaning, and not the meaning that you will read in certain disinformation books written by Freemasons to steer you down the wrong road. Such concepts are identified, along with the Masons, as part of the kingdom of Satan. The document not only defines the concerns of the Catholic Church about Freemasonry at that time, but in the negative, so clearly defines what Freemasons believe that I have included the complete text of that papal bull as an appendix to this book, and I urge you all to get this book and read it. Finally, it should be added that the events described here were part of a great watershed of Western history. The feudal age was coming to a close. Land and the peasant labor on it had lost its role as the sole source of wealth. Merchant families banded into guilds and took over whole towns with charters as municipal corporations. Commerce led to banking and investment, and towns became power centers to rival the nobility in wealth and influence. The universal church, which had fought for a position of supremacy in a feudal context, was slow to accept changes that might affect that supremacy. Any material disagreement with the church was called heresy, the most heinous crime under heaven. The heretic not only deserves death, but the most painful death imaginable. Some dissidents run for the woods and hide, while others organize. In the case of the Fugitive Knights Templar, the organization already existed. They possess a rich tradition of secret operations that had been raised to the highest level through their association with the intricacies of Byzantine politics, the secret ritual of the assassins and the Roshaniya, and the intrigues of the Moslem courts, which they met alternately on the battlefield or at the conference table. The Church, in its bloody rejection of protest and change, provided them with a river of recruits that flowed for centuries. 
More than 600 years have passed since the suppression of the Knights Templar, but their heritage lives on in the largest fraternal organization ever known. And so the story of those tortured crusading knights, of the savagery of the peasants' revolt, and of the lost secrets of Freemasonry becomes the story of the most successful secret society in the history of the world. I've got to take a break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. Spurned by God in the form of the Vicar of Christ on Earth, the Pope, and spurning God in their turn, the Knights Templars banded together in secret and formed what was to become known as Freemasonry. Now the legend goes that Freemasonry sprang up from ancient stonecutters' guilds and the men who built the stone buildings of the age. But Freemason actually comes from the French, Free Maison, which literally means the Sons of Light. Which light? Well, certainly in researching the problem, it is not the light of Christ. It is the light of the fallen angel of light. For when they were forsaken by the church, by Christ's vicar on earth, the Pope, they spurned God and turned to Lucifer. They held to the Luciferian philosophy that the gift of intellect by Lucifer through his agent Satan would in its turn make man God. These men were always on the run. They took the hidden Templar wealth and built a financial empire that stands to this day as the most powerful on the earth. Jews who had traditionally been persecuted throughout Europe flocked to the hidden temple. For there they could believe as they wished and worship whatever God they wished. For all were welcome. Many of the Templars running to ground flocked to England and to Scotland where they fought for Robert the Bruce, who was engaged in an intense battle with the King of England. Now, let me regress just a little bit. King William the Lion, who was born in 1165 and died in 1214, had a daughter, Isabel of Scotland. Well, Isabel married a certain Robert Rose. Robert Rose was a Knight Templar who was heavily involved in the first efforts and was very successful at international banking. Plus, he established the first overt and covert international intelligence-gathering organization, which all, all subsequent intelligence organizations have been based upon since. His son, Sir William Ruse, and his daughter, Lucy Ruse, figure prominently in the story to follow. Lucy married Sir Robert Plumpton. They sired two children, Sir William Plumpton and Alice Plumpton. During this period of time, this family, this family, as the Knights Templar were going to ground, and the male progeny of this family always followed their father's footsteps and entered into the order, they established in secret the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and may have had a significant role in the establishment for intelligence reasons of the order known as the Ancient Order of the Rose and Cross. Now, Alice Plumpton married Sir John Boatler. They gave birth to a daughter, Alice Boatler, who then married John Gerard, who had a child, Constance, who married Sir Alex Standish. The following children issued from that marriage, Ralph Standish, Sir Alex Standish, Roger Standish, and Alice Standish, who then married James Prescott. The children of this marriage were Roger Prescott, Ralph Prescott, John Prescott, and Captain Jonathan Prescott. Jonathan Prescott married Rebecca Buckley. They had two children, Abel Prescott and Lucy Prescott, and Lucy married Jonathan Fay. They sired three children, Samuel Prescott Phillips Fay, 
Samuel Howard Fay, and Harriet Eleanor Fay. Harriet married Reverend James Smith Bush, son of merchant Obadiah Bush. Their son, Samuel Prescott Bush, became the president of Buckeye Steel Castings Company of Ohio, a pioneer family of Franklin, Ohio, between Dayton and Cincinnati, and was one of the members of the Golden Circle and Order of the Quest, also known as the Jason Society, which gave issue to most of the political elite of the United States of America who are, by the way, all, and I mean all without exception, related to each other. Now, Samuel Prescott Bush married, and his son Prescott Bush became a U.S. Senator from Connecticut, the director of Prudential Insurance, the director of CBS, a partner in Brown Brother Harriman, Chairman National Republican Finance Committee, funds placed in Merrill Lynch accounts in Switzerland, under the guidance of Donald Reagan. When he married, that marriage gave issue to the following. Prescott Bush II, an investment banker indicted for fraudulent banking practices. George Bush, chairman of Zapata Oil from 1963 to 64, chairman of the Republican Party, Harris County, Texas, when John F. Kennedy was killed. Delegate to the GOP National Convention, 1964. 1968 member of the 90th and 91st Congress from Texas. From 1965 to 66, Nixon appointed Bush as ambassador to the United Nations to deal with China. He was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, chairman of the National GOP Party, vice president of the United States of America, and president of the United States of America. Four other children were William H. Bush, James Bush, Jonathan Bush, and Nancy, who married Alex Ellis. The issue of George and Barbara Bush was Dorothy, who married William LeBond, John Ellis Bush, Neil Bush, son of the director of CIA, becomes director of Silverado Savings and Loan and launders CIA drug money. Silverado loses over $100 million and Neil goes unpunished. And the two other children, Marvin Pierce Bush and George Bush II. Folks, this intelligence was gathered by one of our agents codenamed John Galt, who spent literally years in dusty libraries and books of genealogy. And I'm not going to tell you which libraries or how he arrived at this information. But it has been checked, it is absolutely accurate, and this is just one portion of the pedigree of George Bush, who's literally related to most of the royal families of Europe. Now, you can have a copy of this chart if you want it. I'll tell you how to get it later, so have your pencils and paper ready. And I'm going to tell you exactly where the money goes. One half of the money goes to help pay for the airtime here. The other half goes to our agent, John Galt, to pay for the years of toil and dusty library books that nobody ever looks in, tracing genealogy. And folks, this is only one of the charts that he has furnished to us, along with others, other agents of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, who are engaged in the exact same research. And we have found that our most productive connections of the secret societies, the royal families, and what's happening in the world today is through genealogy. We have found a direct connection between the Peasants' Rebellion in England, the French Revolution, the Ronald Reagan and George Bush political campaign, and the George Bush political campaign. As far as the Peasants' Rebellion goes, the Encyclopedia Britannica calls it a, quote, curiously spontaneous rebellion. Barbara Tushman, in her 14th century history, A Distant Mirror, said that the rebellion spread, quote, with some evidence of planning. Winston Churchill went even further. 
In his work, The Birth of Britain, he wrote, quote, Throughout the summer of 1381, there was a general ferment. Beneath it all, a organization. Agents moved around the villages of central England in touch with a, quote, great society, unquote, which was said to meet in London. The spark of rebellion was being fanned vigorously, and finally the signal was given. Even though he had been arrested, excommunicated, and even now was a prisoner in the ecclesiastic prison at Maidstone in Kent, letters went out from priest John Ball and from other priests who followed him. Clerics were then the only literate class, so letters must have been received by local priests and were obviously intended to be shared with or read aloud to others. They all contained a signal to act now, which could put to rest the concept that the rebellion was simply a spontaneous convulsion of frustration that just happened to affect a hundred thousand Englishmen all at the same time. This from a letter from John Ball. In it he says, quote, John Ball gritteth you well all and doth you to understand he hath rung in your bell. Now right and might, while and style, God speed every day, which means ideal, now is time. Unquote. From priest Jake Carter, quote, You have great need to take God with you in all your deeds, for now is time to be war. Unquote. From priest Jake Truman, quote, Jake Truman, doth you to understand that falseness and guile have reigned too long, and truth hath been set under a lock, and falseness reigneth in every flock. God do boat, for now is time, unquote. Now you'll notice that in every one of those quotes, there was one phrase that stands out, and that phrase is, now is time. One letter from John Ball, quote, St. Mary Priest, unquote, is worth quoting in its entirety. Even with the medieval English spelling, the meaning will be clear. Lechery and gluttony were frequent points in his accusations of high church leaders. Quote, John Ball sent Mary Priest great well all manner men bides him in the name of the Trinity. Father and Son and Holy Ghost stand mainly together in truth and help his truth, and truth shall help you. Now reigneth pride in prize, and covets is hold, wise and lechery, withouten shame and gluttony, withouten blame. Envy reigneth with Trason, and sloth is take in great season. God do boat, for now is time. Amen. Unquote. Now, folks, if you research the history of the French Revolution, you will hear that the spark, the word that spread through the country like wildfire, that ignited the rebellion in France, was, quote, now is the time. Literally the same phrase. Some say that in the American Revolution the same phrase was heard, and we find mention of it in several texts, but not like it was heard in the Peasants' Revolt in England, and not like it was heard in the French Revolution. But it was heard again in modern times, it was the campaign slogan of the Bush-Reagan campaign and was used again in the Bush campaign. Now is the time. Now is the time. One famous photograph staged by George Bush and selected by George Bush for publication in Life magazine shows him lying in bed holding the pyramid with the capstone in place, signaling to Masons, Freemasons, and members, the priests, of the mystery schools around the world, that he is the one who will bring into fruition their ages, centuries, millennia-old dream of the new world order. In our search 
for the templars, we have followed them right to their gravestones. And on some of their gravestones, it shows the knight leaning back, reclining, with his feet resting upon a dog, denoting that he is the master. On the most of the tombstones, however, we have found something unexpected. The skull and crossbones. Now, when the Knights Templars were persecuted, the fleet, they had vast fleets, an entire navy, disappeared. And no one, at least no one in the establishment historian group, claims to know where they went. But we have found them, folks. They became the pirates and hoisted their symbol of the skull and bones to the yard arm. They became the vast fleet of pirates who roamed the seas of the world and terrorized nations, navies, and merchantmen. And thus arose from the initiation rites of the Templars, the initiatory rites of crossing the equator, the international date line, and others, and accounts for the brotherhood amongst the pirates of the world. Even to establishing seaports that they owned and operated and where they could always find safety. Those on the land established what they called the Brotherhood of Death. Chapters were formed throughout the world. George Bush was initiated in the crypt, or what is known as the tomb at Yale, into the Brotherhood of Death, also known as the Russell Trust, also known as the Skull and Bones. The research of many people have revealed what the interior of the crypt, or what is known as the tomb at Yale, the fraternity house of the Bonesmen, contains. And Anthony C. Sutton, in his monumental work, America's Secret Establishment, all about the skull and bones, and one other who wrote a magazine article and published it, revealed the initiation ceremony, revealed that swastikas were found inside the tomb, revealed that the altar is a pile of bones, and that the secret ceremony that George Bush underwent during his initiation was thus. On the day of his initiation, George Bush was conducted through a long, dark passage into an immense hall draped with black. He was able to see by the faint light of sepulchral lamps, corpses, corpses in their shrouds. The altar, built of human skeletons, stood in the center. Ghostly forms moved through the hall, leaving behind them a foul odor. At length, two men dressed as specters appeared and tied a peak band of ribbon smeared with blood around his forehead. Upon this was an image of the Lady of Loretto. A crucifix was placed in his hand and an amulet hung around his neck. His clothes were removed and laid upon a funeral pyre in a fireplace, while upon his body crosses were smeared in blood. Then his pedanta were tied with string. That's his genitals. Now five horrid and frightening figures, blood-stained and mumbling, approached him and threw themselves down in prayer. After an hour, sounds of weeping were heard. The funeral pyre started to burn, and his clothes were consumed. From the flames of this fire, a huge and almost transparent form arose, while the five prostrate figures went into terrible convulsions. Now came the voice of an invisible hierophant booming from somewhere below as George Bush lay in a coffin naked. The words were those of these oaths which the candidate had to repeat. Quote, In the name of the crucified one, I swear to sever all bonds which unite me with mother, brothers, sisters, wife, relatives, friends, mistress, kings, superiors, benefactors, or any other man to whom I have promised faith, service, or obedience. I name the place in which I was born. Henceforth I live in another dimension, which I will not reach until I have renounced the evil globe which has been cursed by heaven. From now onwards I shall reveal to my new chief all that I have heard or found out, and I shall also seek out and observe things which might otherwise have escaped me. 
I honor the aqua tofana. It is a quick and essential medium of removing from the earth through death or robbing them of their wits of those who oppose truth and those who try to take it from our hands. I shall avoid Spain, Naples, and all other accursed lands, and I shall avoid the temptation to betray what I now have heard. Lightning will not strike as rapidly as the dagger which will reach me wherever I may be should I betray my initiation. Unquote. Now a candelabrum bearing seven black candles is placed before the candidate, and also a bowl containing what is supposed to be human blood. He washes himself in the blood and drinks a quantity of it. The strain around his genitalia is removed. He is placed in a bath to undergo complete ablution. After this, he eats a meal composed of vegetables. At this time, he is given his new name, by which he will be known to all of the others in the order, the Brotherhood of Death. And with the completion of his initiation, George Bush joined all of the male members of his family in a long line of ancestry, traced from Robert Ruse to the modern day. He took his place in the order, the Knights Templar, Freemasonry, and has worked diligently to fulfill his role in the completion of the plan, the great work, the formation of the new world order, the one world totalitarian socialist state, the destruction of all existing nation states, all existing religions, and enslavement of the mob. The very highest degrees of the order show that the rationalism and materialism of the thinkers who developed it were determined to stamp out belief in religion. God and any faith in a deity, the initiate was told, were human inventions and had no real meaning. Subsequently, this was developed further, and the member who arrived at the highest position, that of Rex, or king, learned that he was now equal to a king, and that all men were capable of equal advancement. Hence the need for kings over ordinary mortals was an illusion, and at the highest rank the title of Rex Mundi, or king of the world, is assumed. If you would like to get this genealogy, folks, if you're a CADGI member, it's $5. Send it in to the address that you'll hear at the end of this broadcast. For everybody else, it's $10. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. The 16th century saw the rise of a very powerful society, based upon a secret cult in the mountains of Afghanistan. The Roshaniya are the illuminated ones. References to the existence of this mystical fraternity exist from the time of the House of Wisdom at Cairo several hundred years before. In fact, the Roshaniya are just a later emergence of the old cult of the assassins. It seems likely that small branches were founded in various parts of the Near and Middle East, which would account for the special usage of the names of the eight degrees of initiation among them. The earliest figure named in the history of the cult is one Bayezid Ansari of Afghanistan, whose family claimed descent from the Ansar, the helpers who assisted Muhammad after his flight from Mecca nearly 1,400 years ago. As a reward for this service, he stated his ancestors had been granted initiation into the mysteries of the Ishmaelite religion. The secret inner training which dated from Abraham's rebuilding of the temple at Mecca, the mystical Haram, to the assassins through the Roshaniya and into Europe, via the Knights Templar. Bayezid's own father, however, was known to be as narrowly conventional as anyone in the country, and one account of the rapid rise of the sect has it that Bayezid, after a period of preparation for the normal priesthood, was converted to his strange doctrine by a missionary from the Ismailis, the sectarians holding a secret doctrine supposedly handed down in the family of the prophet, who maintained hidden lodges throughout the world of Islam, and also claimed, after the Crusades, to have penetrated with their ideas even Spain, Germany, France, and parts of Britain. 
However this may be, the illuminated ones soon became more than a headache for the governors of Afghanistan, the Mughal rulers of India and their Persian neighbors. Not far from Peshawar, which is now in the northwest of Pakistan, Bayezid set up a small school where he carefully coached those who had been initiated by him in the knowledge of the supernatural that he claimed. A period of probation was expected from each candidate, during which he would go into periods of concealment or meditation, known as kilowatt or silence. During this time, he was to receive the illumination, which was emanated from the Supreme Being who desired a class of perfect men and women to carry out the organization and direction of the world. Bayezid collected in this way, over a period of three years, about fifty staunch disciples whom he had trained in obedience and to whom, so we are told, he had shown a way whereby they could liberate their inner powers. Well, this meant that they were ready to follow his further instructions. These orders, according to what his opponents say, were that the whole sect would now become bandits to prey upon the rest of the world and all those who could not identify themselves by their secret sign were their legal and lawful prey. Little information is available from the other side, but three letters said to have been written from one branch to another contain an outline, a plan to reshape the entire social system of the world, first taking control of individual countries one by one. And where have we heard that before? We've heard it from every one of the histories of all of these different sects of Mystery Babylon, which on the outward appearance seem to be different from each other. On the esoteric level, are one and the same religion, with one and the same plan, with one and the same goal, all working toward that end. And the end always, always justifies the means. Now, something does survive of the degrees of initiation. The first was Salik, or Seeker, followed by Murid, Disciple. Fakir, Humble Devotee. Arif, Enlightened One. Khwaja, Master. Emir, Commander. Imam, Priest. And Malik, Chief or King. This succession does not follow the usual pattern of promotion in the Muslim mystical secret societies, the Tariqas, and seems to have been specially devised for this one. In the first three degrees, the candidate perfected himself by repetitions of certain phrases which were believed to carry power. Examples are these, Rabba, Afrina'a, Heya, Hafida, Kwawaya. Of these words, all Arabic are Persian. The first stands for the concept of lordship the second for creation, the third for life, the fourth for protection, and the last for absolute power. If they were repeated with deep meditation upon various forms of their manifestations in human life, it was believed the appropriate power would come in to the devotee. Now, no special deity was worshipped, but it was believed that there was a supreme overall power, which was known by the sum of its individual powers, lordship, protection, and so on, a type of pantheism which works its way into the modern mystical societies of today. And that when one had meditated upon them all, and they had become the property of the invocant, he would thenceforward be a man of complete power. Now, folks, this kind of idea underlies a good deal of religious and magical thinking in many faiths, though it is seldom put in as concise a manner. The enlightened one of the fourth degree was he who could attain, during the rituals, complete identification with this overall power and was guided by it in all that he did. It was said that he could communicate directly with the unknown or hidden supervisors. Now this meant that, apart from the guidance of the chief, he was free to suit his own pleasure in life. No theological or social bonds limited him. 
It is at this stage, said the Illuminated, that the Arif could perform acts of wonder and magic, influence the physical world, and know the secrets of others. He attained this degree through the acceptance of him by the Master, to whom he had confided his dreams and mystical ecstasies. The Master alone really knew whether these were true or false experiences and promoted him accordingly. Some people proceeded to the higher degrees without going through all the lower ones because they were helped by the spirits of former illuminates who had died. The master, emir, imam, and melek degrees were reserved for the very highest men and women initiates. After the fifth degree, the segregation of the sexes in rituals was no longer practiced. Anyone of the degree of imam and higher could start his own lodge, and make his own disciples. Bayezid decided to move his headquarters into the most inaccessible mountains of Afghanistan, where he set up a large and luxurious castle, and from which he directed his military and bandit operations designed to overcome the rest of the East. His missionaries were sent far and wide, but received little official support. The cult did, however, spread among merchants and soldiers who thought that this gateway to mystical experiences was something to enter. They contributed lavishly to the chief's upkeep and his most expensive military, political, and espionage system. The heady wine of this success seems to have affected the prudence of the head illuminate more strongly than it should for his claims became more and more extreme in public, as most usually do. There was, he now preached, no afterlife of the kind currently believed in, no reward or punishment, only a spirit state which was completely different from earthly life. The spirits, if they belonged to the order, could continue to enjoy themselves and be earthly powers, acting through living members, but that was all. The preaching of this spiritual vampirism seemed to delight his followers, as much as it infuriated his enemies, because Bayezid now gave out more and more of the new doctrine based upon his no-afterlife creed. Eat, drink, be merry, gain power, look after yourself. You have no allegiance except to the order, he told them, and all humanity which cannot identify itself by our secret sign is our lawful prey. The secret signal was to pass a hand over the forehead, palm inwards, the countersign to hold the ear with the fingers and support the elbow in the cupped other hand. And you can see that sign be exchanged even today in the courts of law all over the United States of America between lawyers and judges, defendants and judges, prosecutors and judges, prosecutors and defending lawyers, etc., etc., etc. Bayezid took to himself the style of Pir Arashan, or Sage of Illumination, and founded a city at Hashnagar, which was to be the center from which Illuminism was to spread all over the world. Now, each member of his following was given a new name upon entry. Does that sound familiar? And this name depended upon the guild to which he, in theory, belonged. According to Bayezid, all humanity was divided into professions. His were lamp makers. Some members were the makers, others sold lamps. Some were known as this kind of lamp, some another. Lamp of the Darkness was a typical example. Among the other guilds noted are those of the builders. Does that sound familiar? Soldiers, merchants of various kinds, and scribes. They can be found today in organizations such as the American Medical Association or the American Bar Association, etc., etc. Writing in the 19th century, an Afghan scholar who was by no means fond of the society of the Roshaniya claimed that they were, in fact, an organization devoted to fighting against the tyranny of the Mughals and that the banditry and strange doctrines attributed to them were untrue, allegations by interested parties. 
He based this upon two manuscript copies of the objectives of the order, which seem to have stated that it was dedicated to influencing people of importance throughout the East and West towards greater justice and self-training into the immense capacities of the human mind, whereby wonders can be caused and through which the harmony of the world will be established. That these ideas are taken from those enshrined in our ancient literature and practices, as well as those of the Persians, many of whom followed the true illuminated path before the new message was revealed, they stated. In the end, the imperial mogul decided that something must be done about the widespread power of the militant mystics of the Hindu Kush mountains. The governor of Kabul arrested Bayezid, clapped him in irons, and paraded him through the streets to show that here was no supernatural being. To give further point to the proceedings, his hair and beard were half-shaved. But this governor, Moshin Khan, was under the ascendancy of his religious guide, one Sheikh Atari, who may even have been a secret adherent of the Illuminated One, for the cult was spreading with rapidity. In any case, he told the governor that Bayezid was undoubtedly a man of great and holy attainments, and that considerable suffering would inevitably attend anyone who treated this man harshly. Bayezid was allowed to escape. The indignities to which he had been subjected kindled his aluminism still higher. Calling his numerous companions, he retired to tribal Terra, where he set up a military and court atmosphere which is still remembered for its glamour, fervor, and mystery. India and Persia <coughs> were to be overcome by force of arms, he announced. To that end, many more were to be enrolled into the ranks of the eliminated. Enthusiastic scenes throughout Afghanistan resulted from the proclamation which was carried far and wide to the accompaniment of kettle drums, wild sword dances. When he was ready, Bayezid, attended by his halka, our circle of dervishes, led the campaign into the lush land of India. Intercepted by the Moshin Khan, whom he had earlier escaped, he was wounded, put to flight, and he eventually died as a result of this encounter. His son, Omar Ansari, proclaimed himself leader, and immediately ordered an attack upon the Pathan tribe of the Yusufzai, who had allied themselves with the Mughal. He was killed by the hillman, and his own son, quote, the servant of the one, unquote, took over the leadership. And by the middle of the 17th century, this youth had been killed, defending his castle against a Mughal expeditionary force. His infant son escaped with some of his followers into Afghanistan proper, where the cult was restarted. The descendants of this Abdul Kidar, servant of the powerful, continued to rule the fanatics and to send their teachers far and wide. The creed eventually split into two divisions, the military and the religious. And nowadays it is only the followers of the latter who survive, still a secret cult, which might, given the right conditions, have touched off a movement as important as that of the assassins. Now, Forty years after the last religio-military leader of the Afghan Illuminated Ones died, a society of the same name, the Illuminati, came into being in Germany, formed, it is said, by Adam Weishaupt, the young Jesuit priest, a professor of canon law at the Jesuit Ingolstadt University, Coincidences of date and beliefs connect these Bavarian Illuminati with the Afghan ones, and also with the other cults which called themselves Illuminated. In actual fact, they are all the same. The beginning of the 17th century saw the foundation of the Illuminated Ones of Spain, the Alumbrados, condemned in an edict of the Grand Inquisition in 1623 out of which the condemned Ignatius Loyola emerged as a man, as a man immune to prosecution, arrest, or accusation from any king, prince, or prelate, as the head of one of the most powerful secret societies ever organized, the Society of Jesus, now known as the Jesuits. Ignatius Loyola had been the leader of the Alumbrados in Spain. 
and it was his sect. The illuminated ones are the alumbrados, which became the Society of Jesus. In 1654, the illuminated Guernets came into public notice in France. Now, documents still extant show several points of resemblance between the German and Central Asian Illuminists, points which are hard to account for on the grounds of pure coincidence, and yet which still might, one supposes, be nothing more than that. The Prophet Muhammad, for example, is claimed as an initiate by the Western Illuminati. Their calendar is the very same which survived in current usage in the former Iranian territories among the Afghans of the time. New Year's Day with them was the same day as the Persian and Afghan Nevroz festival. Further, the degrees of initiation, although seemingly artificial ones coupled with some of the degrees of Freemasonry, were also eight. And there are parallels in the naming of the individual degrees. Like the Roshaniya, the Illuminati stated that they had the objective of gaining important converts for the purpose of improving the state of the world. A comparison of the degrees shows the similarity. In the Roshaniya, the seeker, and in the Illuminati, the apprentice. In the Roshaniya, the disciple, in the Illuminati, the fellow craft. In the Roshaniya, the devotee, in the Illuminati, the master. In the Roshaniya, the Enlightened One, in the Illuminati, the Illuminatus Major. In the Roshaniya, the Master, in the Illuminati, the Illuminatus Dirigens. In the Roshaniya, the Commander, or Emir, and in the Illuminati, Prince. In the Roshaniya, Priest, in the Illuminati, Priest. In the Roshaniya, King, or Chief, in the Illuminati, King. Now, the early stages of initiation were designed to admit people into the Brotherhood to test them for reliability and possibly to train them for responsible tasks connected with the greater diffusion of knowledge. Even in higher degrees, it seems that tests are also applied. Those who were to become priests, for example, were taken to a secret place where a throne stood, with before it the choice of priestly or royal regalia. The aspirant had to make the choice. Those who opted for the symbols of worldly power were dismissed promptly, but candidates taking up the sacred vestments were saluted with the phrase, Hail, O Holy One. The members of this degree were considered teachers in whose hands was the training of disciples. Priests identified themselves with a secret sign. Both hands crossed were placed flat upon the head. In shaking hands, the priest extended his palm with the thumb held vertically upwards. The countersign was a fist with the thumb enclosed within it. Princes were those who could influence events at a very high level, either in academic or political affairs. The room in which the initiation to this high and secret degree was celebrated was hung with red. The garments which the prince was to wear were red and white. Now these are, of course, the colors of the Ishmaelis as well. In the ritual, the candidate is presented as a slave and states that he wants to liberate society from tyranny. The sign of the degree was the extending of both arms. As the countersign, before taking the hand of another, the prince gripped both his elbows. In 1786, a raid upon the house of an influential lawyer, Zwack, revealed secret papers connected with the order. And it is through those that many of the inner workings of the organization became known. Men were to be influenced through their women folk, and a large-scale plan for initiating women members was at an advanced stage of development. It has been widely claimed and touted that many of the charges which were made against the German Illuminati were false, and that the possession of instructions, for instance, on forging seals, was due to the fact that the lawyer's whack had a collection devoted to that subject, as a matter of legal interest to him. It is also said that the project of enrolling women and young girls had in actual fact been taken from the aims of a very different society, the Mopses. While this matter still remains open, however, one may as well examine some of the documents which are stated to have belonged to the society. 
Zwack had written in his own hand a document describing the manufacture of a strong box which would blow up if it were tampered with. He also had a collection of impressions of the seals of several hundred important persons and the already mentioned data on how to forge or substitute them. These, he stated in a letter of protest, were a part of the exhibits of his criminological collection. <laughs> The famous memorandum detailing the plan to win over women to the cause comes from papers seized at the home of Baron Bassus, one of the members. The document states that women are the best means of influencing men. They should be enrolled and into their minds put a hope that they might themselves in time be released from the tyranny of public opinion. Another letter asks how young women can be influenced, since their mothers would not consent to their being placed under the Illuminati for instruction. Five women were suggested by one member as a start. They were four stepdaughters of one of the Illuminati, who were to be placed in the care of the wife of yet another Illuminated one. They, in their turn, would enlarge the society through their friends. It was further mentioned that women are not considered to be really suitable for such an undertaking, because they are, quote, fickle and impatient, unquote. But the order was most sorely hit by the fact that something quite discreditable to the character of the founder was discovered, and it was thought that he might be trying to use the organization for personal reasons. Now, the establishment version goes something like this. Weishaupt, upon the suppression of the order, refused a pension which he was offered after he had been dismissed from his professorial chair. He attributed his downfall to the machinations of the Jesuits, whom he hated and who had opposed him, as he was not of their number, whereas they considered the university post which he held to be a long-standing prerogative of their own. And nothing could be farther from the truth. For Adam Weishaupt was himself a Jesuit priest, holding a professorial chair at a Jesuit university. Now he and Zwack were both banished, and little is heard of them thereafter, although there are rumors that they carried on the society, respectively, in Saxe-Coburg in the Netherlands. Another incident that you will not hear in establishment accounts is the story of the messenger riding from one Bavarian Illuminati lodge to another, who was literally struck by lightning, divine intervention, if you will, struck dead from his horse in his pouch, carrying the papers of a secret plan to take over individual nations and ultimately the world, were put into the hands of the Bavarian government. And many of the portions of these papers are almost word for word what later became known as the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion. We've got to take a short break, folks. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this short pause. Illuminism had spread to France. However, some years before its suppression in Germany, influential personages were members, many drawn from the ranks of the important Free Masons of Paris. As in the case of the German branch, it was soon alleged that they pursued terrible aims and practiced frightful orgies. An extract from a French book of the 1790s, La Secte des Illuminés, will give a fair idea of this. The huge chateau of Ermininville near Paris was one of the chief lodges of the Illuminated. It belonged to the Marquis of Girardin, who protected Rousseau and later gave him a tomb on his estate. Saint Germain, the notable impostor, presided over it. He claimed to be a thousand years old and to be able to make gold. He was said to be immortal, but strangely died in 1784. And even today, some Looney Tune wackos claim that they converse with St. Germain, who's still alive, walking around in a modern-day suit and tie. Well, on the day of his initiation at the Chateau of Ermininville, the candidate was conducted through a long, dark passage into an immense hall draped with black. There were faint lamps, sat around the room. 
There were men dressed as corpses in shrouds. There was an altar of human skeletons which stood in the center of a large hall. And in the darkness, in the flickering low lamplight, the priests conducting the initiation resembled ghostly forms moving through the hall. And everywhere there was the stench of some terrible odor. Two men dressed as specters always appeared and tied a pink band or ribbon which was smeared with blood around the forehead of the candidate. Upon this was an image of the Lady of Loretto. Does this sound familiar, ladies and gentlemen? A crucifix was placed in his hand and an amulet hung around his neck. He was asked to remove his clothes, and if he showed any hesitancy, his clothes were removed for him and laid upon a funeral pyre. Crosses of blood were smeared upon his body, and then his genitalia were tied with a ribbon or with string. Then frightening figures, covered with blood and mumbling strange incantations, approached and threw themselves down in prayer. After a long period of time, weeping, crying, wailing broke out as if a herd, a plethora of mourners, were bereaved upon the death of their closest and deepest love. The funeral pyre burned brighter and brighter. All of the clothes of the initiate were consumed. And from behind or near this fire, one of the priests emerged almost as if he had taken form from the smoke of the pyre itself. And the five figures went into convulsions and loud wailing and screaming took place. And then came the voice of someone concealed behind a curtain. These oaths which the candidate had to repeat. Quote, In the name of the Crucified One, I swear to sever all bonds which unite me with mother, brothers, sisters, wife, relatives, friends, mistress, kings, superiors, benefactors, or any other man to whom I have promised faith, service, or obedience. Quote, I named the place in which I was born. Henceforth I live in another dimension, which I will not reach until I have renounced the evil globe which has been cursed by heaven. From now onwards I shall reveal to my new chief all that I have heard or found out, and I shall also seek out and observe things which might otherwise have escaped me. I honor the Aqua Tofana. It is a quick and essential medium of removing from the earth through death or robbing them of their wits, of those who oppose truth and those who try to take it from our hands. I shall avoid Spain, Naples, and all other accursed lands, and I shall avoid the temptation to betray what I have now heard. Lightning will not strike as rapidly as the dagger which will reach me wherever I may be, should I betray my initiation, unquote. Then, a seven-branched candelabrum bearing seven black candles was placed before the candidate, and a large bowl containing human blood. The candidate washed himself in the blood and drank a quantity of it. The strain around his genitalia was removed, and then he was carried to a bath to undergo complete ablution. After this, he was given a meal composed of root vegetables. Now, folks, <laughs> while it is possible that such ceremonies as this have actually taken place, and we know that they have, because it is exact, the exact ceremony that George Bush underwent, in the crypt, or what is known as the tomb, the skull and bones, 
at Yale University. But it will be recalled that such items as human blood are generally not of the genuine variety in any society other than those reputed to be dedicated to criminal or perverted ends. Well, I have this to say. No one knows but those who actually take part in the ceremony, whether it's chicken blood or human blood or pig blood or cow's blood. And as with the initiations of other societies, there is no doubt that the candidate may have been made to believe that he was actually going through an initiation which involved horrible things of this nature, such as human blood. Initiation into the ancient mysteries was often accompanied by the exposure of the candidate to fear and other emotions in order to make him receptive to the oath or message which was to be made manifest. It has been said, folks, that the European version of the Order of the Illuminati contributed in no small measure to the development of revolutionary doctrines which eventually culminated in the Russian and other communist machines. And in fact, for those of serious study who have perused the depths of the available material, as I and others have, have no doubt, have no doubt whatsoever, that communism, international socialism, is the direct product of the mystery schools of the Illuminati, as was the formation of this nation, which was guaranteed to lead us in to what is known as the New World Order, Novus Ordo Seclor, the formation of a one-world totalitarian state ruled by benevolent despotism, is the way that they put it, and there is little doubt that the order was dedicated to the overcoming of princely power, as it was then known, and to the diffusion of anti-religious ideas. And this can best be seen by examining the development of the teaching of the member as he progressed from one degree of initiation into the next. Now, folks, many young enthusiasts with a taste for mystery and desire to fight oppression in any form were drawn through a deliberate plan from the ranks of all of the colleges and universities and from all of the other supposedly benevolent fraternal organizations. After an oath of obedience and silence had been extracted from the candidate, he was then handed over to a director or teacher, or, if you will, hierophant, to be taught that the order was one of discipline and effort and that the final objectives were to do good through leaving aside all preconceived notions and upon the basis of free thought to lead mankind to salvation. But salvation granted by who? And salvation from what? That is the question that intelligent men should be asking. However, it's been my experience that most men and most women don't ask any questions whatsoever, or very few, anyway. Those who managed to show that they were likely to accept the next stage in teaching were advanced to the rank in which he was made to swear that he would work under the orders of his masters without doubt or question. He would not use his critical faculties in any way, in any matter, connected with such instructions. Now, in the lower ranks are <laughs> the nursery for all you Blue Lodge Master Masons out there who think you know so much and are nothing more than the greatest group of followers ever conceived and let loose upon humanity. Yes, in the nursery, the member was very much in the dark as to the way in which the order was run and how it should accomplish its design of freeing the world. As he progressed, however, he found that a part of his service to the society was to gain financial and social power and to place them at the disposal of the group. Indeed, he was expected to be a diligent mason and to try to gain control 
over Freemason funds. It was not until the tenth rite of promotion had been completed that the member was given, with the grade of priest, certain definite knowledge. And now today, in the order known as the Scottish Rite, this information is not given until the candidate actually reaches the 30th degree, according to the actual writings of the man who was the Grand Commander of all Freemasonry of the world and of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States, Mr. Pike, General Pike. Well, this knowledge included the fact that the Illuminati were proposing to destroy princes and prelates throughout the world and were to remove forever the feeling of local nationality from the minds of men. Another goal was to destroy all existing religions. The ways in which this was to be done involved infiltrating high positions in education, administration of government, the military, and, of course, the press. The very highest degrees showed that the rationalism and materialism of the thinkers who developed it were determined to stamp out all belief in religion, God in any faith in a deity. The initiate was told were human inventions, and they had no meaning whatsoever. Now, this was developed further in the member who arrived at the highest position in the order, or that designated as Rex or King, learned that he was now the same as any king, on the same level, with the same rights, and the same divine right of rule, and that all men were capable of equal advancement. But all men were not equal. Hence the need for kings over man was an illusion perpetrated by those in power, and this perpetration was to be broken at all costs. And the highest for the man who sat at the head of the council, the council of hidden supervisors, made up of nine members, was designated as Rex Mundi, or literally translated, King of the World. In their machinations to overthrow, topple the kings and queens of all of the countries of the world from their thrones, they established the United States of America in the English colonies in the New World, and its ultimate goal, its secret destiny, was to be the catalyst to bring into the world what they called the Great Society or the New World Order. And it certainly worked. Dear listeners, as you can look back through history, the granting of the common man of liberty, fraternity, equality, freedom that he had never tasted or known before in history, lit the spark that then ignited the French Revolution, of course, with the leadership and the manipulation of the people of the Illuminati, the lodges of Freemasonry, the ancient order of the Rose and Cross and others, the highest level, are all the same, with the same goals. And this spark of revolution spread throughout the world, and until we all grow up and learn how to stop this, it will continue. As the secret societies propel us, manipulate us, deceive us, lie, operating in secret, infiltrating everything decent and good that man has ever built, destroying it from within, bringing closer and closer their goal of what they believe to be a utopia on earth, a one-world totalitarian socialist order. They hope to create the world where they will rule, as being the ones who possess the only truly mature minds. They will establish a council of advisors to a world charismatic political and religious leader who will be the outward rule, 
But he will really take his orders from this benevolent despotism, this council of learned elders. And everyone on the face of this earth will be under total control for every 24-hour period of their lives. There will be one world religion catering to the needs of man, not man obeying the laws of any god. The general rule will be, as has been touted many, many times by these people, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And even murder will be considered to be a learning experience, provided that the perpetrator actually learns something. People who exhibit violent tendencies as a matter of normal behavior on their part will simply be eliminated. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this is beginning to come together and make sense to you. If it doesn't, as yet, we have a long, long way to go, as you have probably already begun to understand. Now, folks, we are at the current time $1,800 in the hole for airtime. If you want this program to stay on the air, we had better start receiving some donations from your end. Now, those of you who have been donating, and some of you have sent sizable contributions to WWCR to pay for airtime, we sincerely thank you. But all those of you who have been sitting out there doing nothing, contributing nothing, and absorbing the years and years of work from me and all of the members of CAGI who bring together this wealth of information so that you can receive it. It's time that you put up your fair share. So send it in now. You can send it in to the address given at the end of this program. And while you're at it, ask for a packet of information and you'll get it. Or you can call Stan at 602-567-6109. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you.